All right, looks like we are up. So good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our January 4th, 2021 Burlington City Council session. I apologize in advance if I say 2020, we are in 2021. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, this meeting is being held via the Zoom platform. The meeting is also streaming live on the City of Burlington's YouTube page at youtube.com slash C-O-B-N-C. And please note this meeting is being recorded. If anyone is having any technical or connection difficulties, please contact our public information specialist, John Vernon, at 336-513-5440 for support. For staff comments or to address council, uh, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom or star nine to alert the meeting host. That you <laughs> the limited matter, I am Mayor Ian Baltudis, and I'd like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on this agenda are present and can hear me. Members present, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mayor Pro Tem, Kathy Hikes. Kathy, I'm here. Okay, I had a delay on your sound. Council Member Jim Butler. Here. Council Member Bob Ward. Here. Council Member Harold Owen. Here. <coughs> Thank you. Staff, participating when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. City Manager Hardin Watkins. Here. City Manager or City Attorney David Huffman. Yeah. David, I didn't hear any sound. You there? there. Here. There we go. Uh, Interim City Clerk Beverly Smith. Here. Assistant City Manager Nolan Kirkman. Here. Assistant City Manager Rachel Kelly. Here. Director of Finance and Risk Management Peggy Reese. Here. Recreation and Parks Director Tony Laws. Here. Community Engagement Manager Morgan Laster. Here. Police Chief Jeff Smythe. Here. Water Resources Director Bob Patterson. Here. Director of Planning and Transportation Mike Nunn. Here. And Golf Course Manager Jonathan Dudley. Here. Excellent. All right, with that out of the way, we will move on to item one in our agenda, the Auditor's Report for fiscal year 2019 to 2020, presented by Stout, Stewart, McGowan, and King. At this time, I'd like to recognize our Director of Finance and Risk Management, Peggy Reese. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to appear before you tonight. Um, I know they need no introduction, but we have Tom McGowan and Patricia Rhodes here with us who are here to present the audit report for the year, fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. And so I will turn it over to Patricia. Oh, thank you, Peggy. Um, thank you, Council, for allowing us to be with you to discuss the audit report for June 30th, 2020. We are reporting you to you tonight because as auditors, we work for the council. We work with, st with city staff members on the audit. This report was submitted to the local government commission for their review, which is required by all governmental units every year. This report was prepared in the prescribed format of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. The summary information appears in the front of the report and there's more detailed information as the report continues. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report or CAFR for short for June 30th, 2020 was prepared by the City of Burlington uh, finance staff. The sections of the CAFR that are actually prepared by Stout, Stewart, McGowan and King are the audit opinion letter on Roman numeral page 12, and in the compliance section, the report on internal control over financial reporting on page 174, and the report on compliance for each major federal program on page 176, and the report on compliance for each major state program on page 178. On Roman numeral page nine, their Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting was received for the year ending June 30th, 2019, marking the 21st consecutive year the award has been received by the city, which is a great accomplishment, especially due to all the constant changes that are being required in reporting. As stated in the opinion letter on Roman numeral page 12, the statements are the responsibility of management. They are also responsible for the preparation 
and fair presentation of the financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Our responsibility as auditors is to express an opinion on the statements based on our audit, which is conducted in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. The opinion that we are rendering on the financial statements is an unmodified opinion, which is the best and cleanest opinion that can be, that can be received. The management's discussion and analysis that starts on Roman numeral page 15 of the report is an excellent overall summary of this very expansive and detailed report. It contains financial highlights, financial analysis and economic factors, and budget highlights for 2021. A new schedule that appears in this year's report that was not in last year's is the capital project schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for the street resurfacing project that can be found on page 124. The overall citywide tax collection rate for 2019 taxes was 99.62%, which is an excellent co collection rate. In the compliance section in the back of the report on pages 183 and 184, there is a list of grant monies that were expended during the year for federal and state grants. We do consider inter internal control as part of our audit, but we do not express an opinion on internal control. We do consider internal control in determining appropriate audit procedures. As part of our consideration of internal control, nothing came to our attention that we are required to report to you either as a material weakness or a significant deficiency. If something had come to our attention, we would have reported this to you in a separate letter. There is a separate three page letter that you should have received that is required communication to the council as part of our professional standards about our audit. Just to summarize what is in the letter, we disclose that we have not communicated any difficulties with management in performing our audit, nor did we have any disagreements with management over any accounting, reporting, or auditing matters. We continue to work with finance staff on the implementation of any new governmental accounting standards board statements issued and any effect those standards would have on future financial reporting of the city of Burlington. Are there any questions for me? Thank you, Patricia. Any questions from council? Okay, the only question right. I have is why um, the capital projects are new to the CAPER. What, what? Oh, it was just a new project that was started during the year. Um, that um, it that was not in process the previous year. So that's why that's a, a new project for this year. Thank you. Any other questions from council? All right. Well, we would like to thank Harden, Peggy and all the city staff for their assistance during the audit. Because of COVID-19, it was a challenging audit year, of course. Uh, we had to alter some of our audit processes, but with the use of available technology, we were able to uh, make those alterations and complete the audit successfully. Thank you to the council for allowing us to be the independent audit firm for the city. We are local and available anytime for any questions that the council may have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Patricia. Tom, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Peggy, anything else you want to add on this agenda item? No, nope. no. we're good. <laughs> Fairly standard annual review. We appreciate yes, you this and uh, we continue to thank all of our employees for the high standards that they hold in uh, maintaining our financial records. So Absolutely. a lot of work that goes into this document and uh, we appreciate everything being clean and orderly. So. Peggy, let me ask you one question. The, the CARES funding, what is, it was, I know that came through the county, but what does that show up in the audit? 
it's not going to show up in this year's audit because we accrued expenses and um, so that they will come through in the fiscal year 2021. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you all. With that, we'll move on to item B on our agenda, City of Burlington 2021 Federal Advocacy Agenda. And this time I'll recognize our city manager, Harden Watkins. Harden, you're muted. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. We'll get uh, Scott to add Jennifer Emo. Jennifer is joining us from DC today. As you all know, she's our uh, advocate up in Washington for all uh, federal matters representing the Ferguson Group. Uh, and so I'll quickly uh, yield the floor to Jennifer and she'd like to review our proposed uh, advocacy agenda for the next calendar year. So Jennifer, you're up. All right, thank you Hardin and thank you Mayor and members of the council and good to see many staff. Um, Happy New Year. Um, I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday. Way to jump right back into it here Monday the 4th. Um, I also want to recognize my colleague Rebecca Bliss is on the call as well today um, and she joined me as we spoke um, to all of you, um, uh, the elected officials, as well as um, your staff in discussing what projects, what issues they were working on um, that we may be able to help them with at the, um, and you all with at the federal level. And so as a result of those conversations, we put together this matrix that we call a federal agenda um, and broke it up into, um, into departments. Um, I would typically say that this is, um, you know, this is pretty much, um, the, you know, what we like to do is have mayor and council approve, uh, do a formal approval of our federal agenda. Um, and then we present the agenda to your uh, congressional delegation. And this is what we use as our roadmap um, in working on, um, on projects and issues um, uh, for the city of Burlington. Um, it doesn't mean that if something comes up and it's not on this agenda or roadmap that we can't um, respond, uh, but this, is, this just kind of gives us uh, a guide. Um, and it also gave us an opportunity to really kind of learn in depth what some of your priority projects are. Um, I think that we have a very robust list here. Um, this is, I, I do also want to, it's important for us to manage expectations as well. Um, I do want to say, you know, these are all um, projects that have the opportunity for action, but action is not going to happen on every single one of these line items. Um, it is, uh, you're in for the long game. Um, I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that this would necessarily happen, but I, um, just in the, um, in the funding bill that was passed um, it, just before Christmas, I finally got a provision in there that I've been working on for 12 years. <laughs> so hopefully the long game for the city of Burlington is not 12 years, but the point is, is it's, um, things are much slower in Washington, D.C. than they are in Raleigh. Um, and then of course, uh, much slower than at the local level. So um, we will uh, forge ahead in working for your priorities um, as we work with a new, a new administration um, and your congressional delegation. So, um, I don't necessarily want to go through this um, line by line, but there is one thing um, that I did not include on here that I'm happy to include, or I can just use it as we work on, you know, talking points for um, conversations with your delegation. And one of the, I, 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 it, it thought, um, it, to me, it seemed as though, we should put something in there about additional um, COVID relief and what we would like to see out of um, any further package um, that may come down the pike. We, of course, um, doggedly communicated your priorities to the delegation. Um, we were very close to getting direct uh, uh, assistance um, to all local governments, regardless of size, and again, that would be direct. So you're not going through the state, you wouldn't be going through the county, it would go directly to the city of Burlington. So um, I think there, 
we could add a section in here really called other priorities that's sort of a, a kind of a dump of other, you know, uh, kind of non-related issues um, that we could put something in there about the city um, supporting, um, you know, when Congress considers the next COVID relief package, we want to ensure that direct funding to local governments is included. Um, another thing that also is not on here that, uh, you know, we could certainly add that I think all local governments um, support is um, continued preservation of tax exempt municipal bonds um, and um, a reinstatement of, um, a, of a, a process called advanced refunding, which um, really in short is if you have a tax exempt municipal bond, um, but then the uh, interest rate uh, decreases um, before you could do advanced refunding, which means you could um, basically um, refinance that municipal bond at the lower rate without losing the tax exempt status. Um, unfortunately, in the tax bill that was passed uh, several years ago, um, they eliminated advanced refunding. So that might be something that we include on there. Um, and then just a general statement about the need to, you know, monitor um, various federal agency rules and regulations, and of course, give you the opportunity to comment when appropriate. Um, but those would be really, um, as I kind of stepped back after we developed this agenda and thought about it a little bit more. Um, those would be kind of the more general things that I would recommend adding. But, um, you know, we will, we've gotten the debrief from the DOT on the build grant um, and we'll take the information that we learned from DOT and, um, you know, uh, hopefully make your application uh, more competitive. But um, that's not the only thing that that project is hinging on. I think that there are going to be other opportunities to secure, um, you know, federal assistance for various aspects of the Maple Avenue corridor project, as well as many others. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before um, opening it up to, to questions, um, we are um, the newly elected chair of the House Appropriations Committee has said that there will be earmarks that um, there, there will be earmarks included in um, in the House passed appropriations bills. What that is going to look like, we're not sure. What the parameters are, we're not sure. But many of the projects that are included on your federal agenda are projects that historically would have been eligible for earmarks. So I just want you to be aware that we may be doing a quick pivot on some of these and, um, and, and not just looking, um, you know, when we're looking at projects, specifically for federal funding assistance, we may not just be looking at competitive grants, we may also be looking at, um, at the whole earmarking process. Um, the, the good and bad thing there is, um, uh, I will say the bad is that there are not a lot of staff left on Capitol Hill um, that uh, were there when earmarks were um, alive and well. Um, a lot of members, elected members are, but we were um, there, uh, been around for quite a while. Um, and so we've actually offered ourselves as, um, you know, sort of touch points for staff um, to say, hey, listen, we're happy to kind of walk you through um, the X's and O's of, of, of this whole earmarking process and try to make it as easy for them as possible. So um, we're on top of it. And, um, and you know, it, it, interestingly, even just as an aside, um, you know, there's, you know, of course, um, Congressman David Price um, is the, uh, is the chair of the Transportation uh, and HUD Appropriations Committee, and none of his staff were ever around for earmarks. But we work closely with his office, and we've offered our assistance, and so hopefully um, we will help them help you. Very good. So Jennifer, how would you like to best go through this? I know you said well, we could skip over line by line, and I'm amenable to that. Um, a lot of these items as presented in the agenda packet are things our council's been through over the yeah. past few years, so we're very familiar with them. 
Um, I guess we could ask council members to call out any items they have questions about on the list you provided. Sure, I think that would be the best the best way to do it. Just so you know, we're not sort of going through, like you said, line by line, because I think this is familiar to many of you. But if there are questions or concerns about any of these items, please do let us know. Um, these, this is a obviously this is a draft. This is a presentation to you of what can be included. Not everything has to be included. If it's something that you're really not interested in um, the city pursuing, then that should be discussed in this forum. And Jennifer, if you could, so we are members of obviously North Carolina League of Municipalities related to state advocacy, but then also National League of Cities, which publishes their own advocacy goals. Um, and I know some of the things you mentioned as far as tax exempt muni bonds and um, just monitoring agencies for changes are things that NLC does all the time. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what is your thought on kind of should our approved set of advocacy goals overlap or is it best to kind of say, our list is truly specific to our highest priorities and not just include some of the uh, other key. Yeah, uh, no, so. sure. I think that's a great question. Um, my, I always err on the side of make it specific to Burlington. So um, NLC and the, the North Carolina League even um, have priorities and of course, Many of those are your priorities, but um, you need to be able to communicate how that particular issue impacts the city of Burlington. So I always, um, you know, I, I don't I don't match up necessarily in LC's um, federal priorities and my individual clients federal priorities. I kind of highlight those that I think are a, are or would be of, of greatest um, uh, import and impact to um, my local government clients. If there are more, we can certainly add more, but I do think it's important to have it in there because then they hear it from you. Um, you know, hearing it from the national organization is good. Uh, I take nothing away from that, but hearing it from their constituents is better. Yeah, and so I think a great example would be the broadband related items that we have in here, which is an ongoing discussion, state and national, but is something that we've we've dug into, Kathy and I in particular, in our, our community, and we recognize the need for more and more with COVID going on. So, uh -huh. so that's one where it, it does overlap, but we've had a specific discussion here in our community with that unique flavor. Yes. Um, so I think it's worth being on our goal list. Okay, okay. Good. And um, Mayor, which specific item under, um, and I'm looking at page three of the federal agenda. Which yep. uh, the, so I think the under connection or connectivity between Burlington and Greensboro, um, more specifically the explore opportunities to lease fibers to private entities and increase competition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the broadband access, explore funding opportunities and policy incentives or initiatives to improve broadband service. Okay. We've looked at um, some of the public private partnerships that have been happening mm -hmm. around the state, um, Salisbury in particular, um, and kind of, can we right. explore something like that as okay. a public private here? Okay. And it, that, that's great. Good. I just wanted to make sure I, I, I knew exactly. And and I will tell you too what we do. Um, so just overall kind of that general statement on broadband policy. What we do is for specific issues, we do kind of a legislative tracker. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the 116th Congress, our, our broadband telecom IT legislative tracker was 62 pages long. So with all the bills related to an issue, but you know, there are some that are gonna, they're gonna have legs and there's some that aren't. And to give you the opportunity to see what are gonna have legs, how that it will impact you. And do you wanna put your, you know, your name to it, I think is a great opportunity. So we'll be continuing to do, you know, issue specific, um, uh, legislative trackers um, and sharing those with you all and give you the opportunity to weigh in. Great. Well, Council, if you're amenable, we, um, without going line item by line item, let's at least go section by section through this. So starting with the transportation section um, on the first page, are there any questions or kind of adjustments that Council wishes in, under transportation? 
Just, just for clarification purposes, we are using this as kind of a um, sort of a launching document, but it's going to be a working document. It's we can add or take and make. I heard you say that. I just want to clarify it. So this is kind of a jumping off point. Yes, sir. That's correct. But if there's anything missing that's glaring at this point, happy to add. Sure. So any additions or subtractions or adjustments under transportation? I think this pretty well sums up our main action areas over the last couple of years. And I know we have the multimodal greenway stuff a little late later. So, all right, under economic development. The only thing I would say we need to change there is our action item was to secure congressional support for the EDA CARES Act grant application. Um, we that has been done. Um, that we are, I, I think you guys are, you know, well on your way, um, just shy of an actual like award announcement, um, but certainly on on um, on that track. So I would probably just. Um, I'll probably just change the wording there, um, update the wording, I guess. Is that amenable to council? And yeah. Any other additions, subtractions on economic development? It's been a busy focus area there, so we've got a lot of items. Um, next is parks and recreation. So again, this is where we brought in some of the greenway multimodal aspects. Mayor, just excuse me, could, could, could we go back to the economic development and, yep. and maybe this is not a question for Jennifer, but uh, I'm not sure if Peter's on the line tonight or not, but he said support continued funding for the D Department of Defense's Army Environmental Command radiation uh, remediation efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, how much have we been funded now? I think that's more of a, just making sure that it stays a priority in their funding, because that's what Peter had uncovered as our staff worked to move that ahead, was that it just hadn't been pushed to a front burner for so many years. Um, and so just making sure that our federal uh, legislators understand that we, we recognize that as a priority and the Army Corps has got to do their work before we can really do any major work. So is the word continued proper or just support funding continue is it's in progress okay yeah. pardon anything you want to add on that but. um i think that's a good synopsis the previous owner uh mr owen was i guess not pushing the department of defense at all and so uh that was one of the things to get it on their mm -hmm. calendar as you can imagine department of defense has uh more environmental remediation that they're ever, than they're ever going to complete across the world. Uh, and so you have to be a squeaky wheel here. Uh, so I think that's our, uh, we want to continue to keep that on the minds of our members of Congress to help us if it does slow down. Uh, I think right now we're pleased with the progress and the speed and the pace. Um, but if it does slow down or somehow it fell off the, the, the front burner, uh, we'd want to uh, get members of Congress to help us nudge that along. But uh, I think they're rolling along and Peter is on the call. Peter, I don't know if you want to add anything to my remarks. I think everybody did a good job covering generally where we are at. This was an insertion into the uh, legislative uh, directive uh, to ensure that we, um, that we keep this issue top of mind and in front of our legislators and ensure that we have funding. As Hardin mentioned, there are many contaminated sites and there are these new forever chemicals and other issues that continue to come up and possibly bubble up ahead of this project. So we want to ensure that funding remains a priority uh, to get the site cleaned up and that any uh, public health risks are taken care of in due time uh, and that the site can be redeveloped. And Peter, we've had good response from Senator Tillis's office before. I know brownfields and related sites like this are something that he is particularly interested in, especially for North Carolina. Um, so something where we've got some traction and we just want to make sure we keep that rolling. That, that is correct. And, and just as a quick aside, a, uh, a bidding team was on site a little over a month ago at Western Electric to conduct the next phase of remedial investigation work. So it is an ongoing project and our staff remain involved in an oversight and an advisory capacity. 
Thank you. Anything else under economic development? All right, parks and recreation. I just want to know what the forest legacy program is. I'm not familiar with that. Sure. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I that needs to change. I wrote the wrong legacy program, excuse me. It needs, I was gonna <laughs> slide that into the uh, edits, hopefully without you all noticing. <laughs> but it's the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program, which is part of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I know Tony's on and he actually sent an email um, earlier today. Um, that is a, um, it's a, it's a, a, um, competitive grant program that runs through the state and then each state can identify up to two projects to send to um, the Department of Interior. Um, I believe twice in the past, Tony, if I'm not mistaken, and Rachel, you may know too, um, the, the uh, City of Burlington's um, project has gotten through the state but did not get to the federal end. Um, and that's pro very likely due to a um, you know, a uh, slender amount of federal funds, but um, this, the appropriations bill that was just passed into law, um, increased funding for that um, outdoor recreation legacy partnership program from 25 million to 125 million. Um, so I think, you know, Tony has reached out to his folks in, um, in the recreation department to, um, you know, for all of us to kind of put our heads together and, and come up with a really competitive project there. Very good. And, and, and if I could mention, we have applied twice in recent years for that grant. Uh, we, we made it by the state level. Uh, we were, uh, us in Raleigh were the first time we, we applied. And then uh, I think we may have been the only one that, that was in the last uh, running for this, but um, when we applied, but um, we never got the federal grant. We The state approved us, but never got the federal. So hopefully with the amount of money that's in there now, uh, if we uh, submit an application, uh, hopefully we'll have a better chance of, uh, of getting funded. Tony, what was the project you submitted? Uh, the last one we submitted, Harold, was the uh, uh, trail addition from the animal shelter to the Hall River Trail, uh, making a connection there. And the uh, first one we did was an outdoor learning nature center. Okay. Now, are Tony, just real quickly, are any, either one of those um, projects that you may look to try again or something new? Uh, the, uh, the trail uh, may be a, a consideration, but uh, I've already sent, I just sent this email out this uh, today when I got the notice about the uh, extra hundred million going into this, this fund. Um, and I've already got one, one, uh, uh, person's already talking to me about a, a possible project, but we'll see what we come up with on our staff and, and see what, uh, sounds reasonable and, uh, that we might have a good chance on. Great. And we'll work with Tony and his staff as that project develops. If we do the same project, then what we will likely do is get in touch with folks at the federal level to figure out, um, why that that actual application was not funded and see where we can um, improve uh, the application in the next round to make it more competitive. And it may have very well just been that there wasn't enough funding available. But if there were some areas that needed some um, needed some help, then you know we'll we'll work with you guys to figure out what those are. Yeah. Jennifer, if you don't mind my in keeping up with the, the two years that we applied um, in a in you have to have at least 50,000 uh, population, uh, which we, we meet that, but we're on the lower end of it. Um, all the grants that were approved the two years that we applied went to much larger cities. And I'm talking about big metropolitan areas, unfortunately. So I don't know whether the size has anything to do with it, but it doesn't seem like, and Raleigh, Raleigh the year that they applied with us, they weren't funded either. So uh, as far as I know, North Carolina has never gotten one of these grants. We'll change that. Hopefully. Anything else on parks and recreation? All right, next is water and wastewater. Jennifer, you did mention um, 
COVID related item. So I know we've had a lot of discussions about water bills um, and kind of recovery from the pandemic. We have about 1200 residents who are uh, behind on their water bills. And I, I know some of the funding through CDBG and the CARES has uh, been able to be applied to help residents catch up because we recognize mm -hmm. that, I mean, if somebody's behind, there's really not any way they're gonna be able to significantly catch up. Um, so is, is something like that better put in a general COVID or other category or something in like water, wastewater? Um, um, we, we could do it anyway. I mean, I, I think um, if you have a specific, a specific need, um, actually, I think now that I would put it just all the COVID requests together. Okay. So if you have a specific need, um, like, um, you know, sort of, you know, assistance with water bills, et cetera, then I would add that to the last section that we talk about COVID. Very good. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, obviously the PFAS is an ongoing discussion and so yes. good to we need some guidance there. Yep. All right, anything else on water, wastewater? All right, information technology, we talked about the broadband pieces of this um, already, but any other council discussion? I think a big piece of this is tied up in the state and there's some things we can do in the city, but um, I think especially now that we're all looking at the bottlenecks created by the COVID pandemic and kids and families access to broadband and um, changes in the employment economy of our community, it just becomes more and more relevant, so. But let me, as, as you indicated, Mayor, that's going to take, uh, I would think, some some changing at our state level with state uh, uh, approval for us to be more competitive in this area, would it not, for federal nope. grant? Based on what we learned in Salisbury, as long as you're doing it in a public-private focus, um, then it, there's methods to go forward on it. If you just wanted to do what like Wilson did and have a 100% municipal built and operated system enterprise style like our water, um, that is not currently allowed by the state. Yeah. yeah. And from the communities that I know that are municipal providers that sort of are grandfathered in because they they became those municipal providers long before the state law um, barred them from doing so. Um, they said they wouldn't get into that business again. <laughs> the Salisbury struggled an awful lot in the early stages. I, I, I remember very, very dearly about that. Um, all right, anything else on information technology? Otherwise the next would be this other category. Um, Jennifer mentioned adding COVID, which I think is a good reasonable item because we have some need for the water bill assistance, um, as well as there's been ongoing discussion about revenue replacement. Mm -hmm. um, there's also police and fire too, Mayor, on oh, page four, sorry. No, I, I did, I need to scroll down one more page, so sorry. We'll, That's okay. We'll do police and fire. Uh, so police department, got three items there. Any discussion on that? I think the cops hiring is 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 is, is one that's is much much needed. Yeah, we've been able to leverage that before. That's yeah. Good. Um, fire department. Those are pretty straightforward. Mayor, I'll I'll jump in on. I think uh, council may see a, a request uh, from the fire department next month uh, to meet a deadline of a, a program that's available that would uh, line us up for some. Uh, funding for additional fire personnel yeah. it does not it typically requires a match. But my understanding is, in uh, with some of the COVID uh, legislative changes, it does not require a match, um, and it would be for a three-year period. So Chief Mebbin is uh, gearing up. He's going to meet with the budget team uh, in the next week or so, and then we'll uh, take a look at that and have that ready for a future council agenda. So kind of similar to the cops program, but for exactly. Fire. Great. Um, all right, so Chief, Chief Mevin, any any other words you want to add to that? No, sir, you summed up perfectly. Thank okay. you. Very good. All right, now we'll talk about that other category. Um, <laughs> is council amenable to including a COVID line item here? Any objection to that? I know it's something we've written our federal delegation on throughout this pandemic. You know, I'd really like to see us with COVID relief. There's a 
we can talk about revenue replacement, but you know, quite honestly, if you look at a lot of areas, it's difficult to identify what that is because revenue streams have been pretty healthy. Yeah. But there's an expense side that maybe the community is seeing, certainly on the small business side, certainly like the water and sewer that you alluded to before, Mayor, that we could be a pass-through entity to help uh, alleviate some of that burden. And I think I'd, I would personally like to see us identify those things as a, a way that we can see that the money gets to the right place, but it doesn't just become a general fund uh, item, revenue item. A, a way to, to tackle that, frankly, um, and I wouldn't, I, I would have recommended you do this anyway, is just um, allow greater flexibility to how those, the COVID monies can be spent. Um, and then you're not just saying you want revenue replacement, but it really does open it up to other, um, you know, it, 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 it makes it a more broad use of those funds sure, to include revenue replacement and others. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer, yeah. Wouldn't that play better to both parties at the federal level? I think so. I mean, the issue is, is your delegation knows that you guys are good stewards of their money, but they don't want to be putting into to law, you know, revenue replacement for certain states that haven't been good stewards of their money. So, um, and that's, that's the issue, right? So, um, you know, one thing too, is that, you know, you're not trying to get it to, for, you know, to pay, for, you know, down, like, you know, for your uh, state like pension funds or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. But I'm saying, you know, talk about the a, a more flexible use of the direct funding to local governments so that you can, you know, help your businesses and residents this, you know, as as needed in your community. Um, and each community has different needs, right? So I would just say, make we'll make we can make it as broad um, broad as possible, but clear that you're not looking for again just a uh, you know just to have a slush fund. Yeah, well, I think to Jim's comment, I mean the water is a good good example. So if you have any other language that we can work with staff to include in there, whether it's in this draft or in future. Okay. Um, our, our CAFR talks about how well our community has been able to weather this pandemic compared to many. Uh, and I think that's important. Um, so it's, it's really about closing those remaining gaps and water is a great one. But uh, Jim, if you have other ones that you want to forward to staff as we go forward. Um, again, I, I like the fact that this document can be very specific and Burlington flavored um, and not just the, the generalized asks. So these are what, what do we need from our federal delegation to, uh, be a stronger community. So. Jennifer, for a program like that to, 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 to take, uh, to get a real chance, uh, how, how deep do you have to be in terms of, uh, of proposed regulations and how a, uh, in, back to Jim's point, how a municipality can, can help various businesses. I mean, we talk about water and that's related back to us, obviously, but you know, some of the small businesses I know now, I've talked to a guy today that's, that's really struggling with rent right now. Uh, um, how, how, what's the best way to approach that? You know, I think different, <laughs> different communities have done some, some I think, really um, creative things um, to help and address their specific issues. Uh, you know, I know that for communities that, you know, may have received a, a larger allocation, you know, they developed um, grant programs for their small businesses. They, they um, did, uh, you know, sort of rent abatement for a certain period of time, um, you know, a tax abatement for a certain period of time. So you can sort of create the program that works best for you and them. Um, and, um, and, you know, those, it, and, and the, I guess the point is, and they were able to do that because that was very specifically COVID related and you could point to the data, right? Like you could show the data of, uh, you know, this company has lost, you know, you know, X amount of money because they've had to pay this out and have gotten this in. And, um, and so that, that was kind of a, 
um, an easier one. Um, you know, an issue though with with the you know the the tax abatement. Um, you know that is limiting the funny funds that are coming back to you, right? Um, but then if you are talking about, you know, um, helping with water, then that money is coming back to you. So, I mean, it just sort of depends. Um, and there were some limitations. At first, they said that you couldn't, at first, Treasury had said that you, that the governments could not provide, local governments couldn't provide assistance to individuals to help pay their electricity bill because that actually was then going back into the coffers of the local governments, but they changed that um, so that that was no longer restricted. So, you know, some of these programs, you know, you're sort of the, the you're helping these businesses, but again, it is still filling your coffers. Um, so I, I guess my, my, my answer to that would be is to do an assessment of what, you know, what are your community needs and what can you offer that isn't going to put too much of a strain on the city's budget? Very good. Yeah, so I don't know if it's worth mentioning things like, I know there's discussion about a, another round of PPP. Um, even there was, um, I haven't updated myself on it lately, but there was discussion about the, the finance, the IRS implications of the PPP and other business grant items to small businesses as to mm -hmm. if it was revenue or taxable or all. Something. Exactly. Yes. So like to Jim's point, I think asking for things like that, um, are a win for our small businesses. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. So as much of that information, you know, that we can share and communicate, I'm, you know, certainly happy to do so. It's one of those things I think a lot of communities at the beginning were like, you know, we've got to, we got to figure out what we're, you know, what's happening kind of with our, in our four walls, right? Um, but then realizing this extends much further than just us, the local government, right? We've got to give we've got to work with our small businesses, work with our residents. Um, and so, um, but, you know, most of our reporting and advocacy, frankly, has been really the, just the very specific local government stuff. Um, but, you know, as much information too, as you want so that you can provide to your small businesses, um, we can certainly give that. Um, and as well as communicate those priorities. So if I could get even just kind of a list of the programs that you see. So for PPP, okay, so that's another one to add to, to our COVID list. You know, the water, um, the, the money to help pay the, the water bills. Um, and, um, but I guess, it, and so we could kind of come, you know, kind of create a list under the, that COVID umbrella. So council, if you have any other additions there right now, otherwise, if you uh, have any in the coming days, um, Jennifer is, I know you'd asked about the council officially approving this. Um, do we wanna bring something back around as early as tomorrow or is it something where we, we could take a couple of weeks and bring it back later in the month? You know, it, however, I mean, it's, it, it's entirely up to you all. I mean, I think the, the, the sooner that you do it, the better so that we can get it in front of your delegation. But if it is just a couple weeks um, from now, that that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, and we could, and I don't know how, um, uh, you know, about your sort of local rules. I'm sure David will, Dave, Mr. Huffman will let me know if I'm speaking out of school. However, um, if, uh, you know, you could sort of adopt the federal agenda this evening, but knowing that there are going to be, you know, uh, a few edits, but they're not so like substantial and, and edits that we haven't actually discussed that it would need a further discussion. So council thoughts on, would we like to put this on a consent agenda and officially vote on this? Seeing some head nods. Yeah, we could put it on the consent agenda and then create a window or a time frame for us to submit staff some feedback to go ahead and start working on an update, but, yeah. but, but go ahead and get this uh, on the consent agenda in its current format. Sure. So we want to add that for tomorrow night. 
I'm fine with it. I'm good with that. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So um, any other other items that we wanted included on there? All right. So let me ask you if it's on your consent agenda for tomorrow, if I made some edits um, this evening or first thing tomorrow morning and got it to you, could that be that be the document on your consent agenda? Is that too late? No, that should be fine. Staff can pres uh, provide us the latest copy just shortly before the meeting tomorrow. Perfect. So Jennifer, if you could just get us something by mid, you know, late morning or midday. Absolutely. Uh, then uh, uh, Ms. Smith can get that. Uh, out to uh, all the folks that want to see it in advance. Um, Easily done, yes. Very good. Any other discussion on, on this? All right. Well, Jennifer, Rebecca, we appreciate you all being on this call and uh, having you on the team. And I think as alluded to, communities our size can really score some big wins when we set our priorities and have a great partner up there to, to help us navigate the process. So. We're, uh, we're glad to have you all on board. Well, we're happy to be part of the team and appreciate your your time this evening. And we're looking forward to a successful year. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. With that, we'll move to item C on our agenda. NC League of Municipalities 2021 to 2022 advocacy goals. At this time, we'll recognize our city manager, Harden Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Council members, I think you've gotten a number of handouts from us, uh, some in the packet, some uh, I think you've got my outline that I'm going to follow today. So a couple things we want to work on. Uh, one is to uh, talk about setting a, a virtual special called meeting with our legislators. Uh, we propose doing that the 11th or the 12th, either a morning session or afternoon session, either 830 or 2. Uh, and I'm going to yield uh, to Ms. Smith and see if she she was waiting to hear from all of our um, elected officials, uh, our state elected officials. I'm going to yield and see if she has heard from all three. I have spoken with um, Amy Gailey and Ricky Hurtado, but I'm still waiting for a um, callback from Dennis Riddell. Yeah, and we reached out to them today. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so you... Ms. Smith, will you go ahead and just uh, suggest what, what times seem to work for the two of them? Um, the confirmed times that worked for both of them was the 2 p.m. session on January the 11th or the 8.30 session on January 12th. Um, Senator Gailey mentioned that she was her best availability was 9 a.m. on the 12th. So we've got, I've asked her if she's got any flexibility there, but those are the two times that they had compatible with their schedules. Okay. Cool. Do we want to pick one of those among council right now? Cannot make the 2 p.m. on the 11th, but I can make the 9 on the 12th. Does the 12th work for most other members? Any? Yeah, I can make that work. Okay. Gerald, Bob? Fine. Okay. It would be a Zoom session and we'll publish that notice and then we would um, provide the links for that as well. All right, so let's go ahead and pencil in the 12th, 9 a.m. All right. Beverly, anything else on the scheduling? Nope, I think that's helpful. And uh, as soon as I have a conversation with um, Dennis Riddell, I will confirm everybody's availability there. Okay. Super. Right. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, the next thing I want to jump forward to is the, the review, the League of Municipalities legislative goal statements. They provided uh, the NCLM board provided 17 uh, recommended items and the, the purpose of um, the advocacy goals process is to narrow that down to 10 uh, for the association to move forward with. Um, Rachel Kelly has helped me uh, work through that list and we have kind of flagged 
you, you all saw in some of the materials I sent out prior to New Year's Eve to Ms. Ga Senator Lett Gailey uh, that we kind of flagged five that we thought were of most interest to us. Uh, Ms. Kelly's helped me uh, add another five or six to that list. And so I'm going to yield and let her walk through that list with us uh, and talk about the ones that uh, we, we sort of just throw out as a place to start a conversation that would be our our 10 uh, for the city for this year. Sure. Can you guys see my screen I'm sharing? We can. Yep. Awesome. Um, so just to review what we've put in your packet as sort of an ask as the League of Municipalities does allow each municipality to vote. We'll just need to select who's going to do that on behalf of the city. And then they've given us 17 board recommended goals which our goal is to whittle that down to 10. So we need to select that delegate and register them by the 14th and then go ahead and submit those 10 goals by the 15th. Um, these are in your packet and hopefully you've had a chance to, to read through them, but we went ahead and put them in a slideshow just so we could go through them really quickly. Um, one that we think is very important um, from the staff perspective and from conversations we've had already this evening is to grant local governments authority to build broadband infrastructure to partner with private pro um, providers um, and provide additional funding to help close that digital divide and in, in, in the ways that fit best for communities across North Carolina. So that's certainly of great importance. Um, securing additional COVID-19 funding um, to offset lost revenues was another goal the, the league recommended expanding incentives and funding for local economic development something we find important from a staff perspective we know on council's annual goal retreat economic development site readiness and build outs always a high priority so we flagged that one for your attention um, refining economic tier designation system um, to accurately reflect sub conditions at a county level or sub county level was the next item then we've got item E, revitalize vacant and abandoned properties with enhanced legal tools and funding. is something we've pointed out as being pretty important um, to the city of Burlington, as well as increasing state and federal funding options for affordable housing. Next up, we've got creating permanent and adequate funding streams for local infrastructure. As you know, we lay infrastructure in the ground and we get to maintain it for a lifetime. So any support there is often uh, welcome. The next item is um, providing funding and support for aging water systems, keeping them financially solvent today and into the future across the state. I know that particularly affects a lot of our more rural areas and smaller communities. The next that we've found very important is to ensure state funding for any new state mandated benefits for municipal employees. A lot of times those come down without a funding stream. So that's something we'd like to pay attention to. Um, another is improving statewide funding and support for law enforcement officer training focused on use of force, mental health, and de-escalation skills. Permitting all cities to establish police department citizen review board. I, I don't know that that would be recommended by the city of Burlington, but it's on the league's list. Um, allowing a short grace period for online posting of local emergency declarations while allowing them to take effect immediately. That's in response to some recent um, state um, state legislation requiring immediate emergency declaration posting. Um, increase public safety grant funding and expand allowable uses also would, would be helpful for us. Um, extending notification timeline for any changes of sales tax revenue distribution that's decided at the county, but they only have to give cities a few months notice if they're gonna change that out, which of course affects our budgeting. So that's something that I think would affect us greatly if that were to change with little notice. And the last page here, we've got um, reduced pressure on property tax by expanding local controlled options for revenue generation. Obviously the more flexibility we have in preparing budgets and finding sustainable revenue sources, the better. Um, increasing state funding and support for public transportation development operations to, to support link transit particularly would be important. And finally, improve processes and pavements for moving utility lines located within the right of way during transportation projects of the state. So those are the 17 goals as proposed by the League of Municipalities Board. Um, the, the Green Stars 
have been kind of flagged initially by Harden last week as sort of our big five that would affect us greatly. And then I've put some diamonds next to others that are, are particularly important to the city of Burlington from a, a staff perspective. Obviously there are several of these 17 that affect all cities across North Carolina, including Burlington. So Rachel, the league is asking for 10 from our city. Um, based on the stars and the diamonds, are there 10 flagged there or do we have a couple? Yeah, those that, that should be 10. Okay, great. Yeah. Rachel, is, it was the uh, extend notification timeline for any changes to state, to sales tax, to revenue dis disbursement, uh, was that flagged? We did flag that. You didn't? We did. Good, good. Uh, guys, I'm, I'm just going to speak to this. Uh, my role with the league, this is what occurred in Richmond County last year. And it uh, uh, basically one city is now a small town is getting ready to give their charter up. Um, other, the two larger communities in the county uh, approved a double digit tax increase just to offset the change in the sales tax allocation process. And that whole process needs to be looked at because it was done um, in this, again, it was, it was done in the very beginning of COVID with no, no, people at the council at the commission meeting except the commissioners and one uh, sheriff deputy and the uh, not only the economic uh, impact this had but the um, the just the genuine now distrust amongst the cities in that county is at an all-time high now with the county government it's a it's it's not a good situation at all. I'm not saying Alamance County uh, would do this. Uh, I'm just saying though that cities need to be uh, understand the importance of of that process because it could impact. Uh, it could be up to major impacts. I think it's a good one for us to flag. So, council, any other comments on the ones that staff have flagged? I think these were ones that jumped out to me um, and make the most sense for our community. Some of the things like utility line items um, and the tier stuff. I know from our board discussion at the league, those were um, specific to communities, um, but not necessarily concerns shared across even a large amount of the board members. Um, Council, any, any items that you wanna change from the stars and diamonds that staff have flagged? All right, we okay putting this list uh, on a consent agenda to approve? I think that's a best practice and something the league likes to see is councils actually voting on their item. So any objection to including this on tomorrow's consent agenda? No. All right, very good. Rachel Harden, anything else you wanted to add on this? We also need to, uh, council needs to select a delegate so we can send that into the league as well. Say so I'm, I'd be fine serving as the delegate as I've done on previous years when we've done these uh, voting sessions in person, unless another council member wishes to. Fine, would for you to continue in that role. Okay. All right. Bye. All right, we'll put both of those on the consent agenda for tomorrow then. Very good. Uh, the next thing I had, Mr. Mayor, was to go through our sort of our annual city goal review items. Uh, and again, you all saw some of this information uh, last week and uh, provided me some feedback. So I, I feel like uh, we're beginning to kind of narrow, narrow it down here. So the other things that we would share with our legislators, we're preparing for a, a consent for the conversation we'll have with them hopefully next week. Uh, but talking again about the Maple Avenue corridor, letting them know we were, you know, unsuccessful in the federal build grant application. Um, 
and that we'll continue to look for, for support. We got letters of support from all levels of state government for that last year. We'll try again in 2021. Uh, we do believe after seeing Lexington was successful this year uh, with some substantial match funds uh, for their project coming from North Carolina DOT. Now that was a, 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 a train station, a train depot in the downtown. So a little different animal than what we're proposing, but we will uh, kind of probe to see if we could get some more commitment and, and, and maybe some financial participation from DOT uh, directly as a way to strengthen our application. Since a lot of the expense uh, of our Maple Avenue project uh, is tied up in the interstate ramps and the stuff that DOT and the Federal Highway Administration requires uh, when you start working in that area. So we will try to pursue that just as a, a see if we get any, any traction at all. Uh, the next you see is, a, you know, continuing our city greenway build out. And obviously sometimes those are the state dollars out there. Uh, Council is all aware of our focus on the Burlington Alamance airport area and supporting the development out there. Uh, we know uh, to get some major clients, we're going to need to make some road improvements at 62 and Anthony Road both at the intersection and then also leveling out that hill on Anthony Road. We have discussed that at length with our uh, previous delegation and had some uh, sort of voice support when and if we were ready and had a client. As you all know, when you're dealing with Department of Commerce, uh, if you have an actual client, uh, it makes the conversation go much smoother and easier uh, versus just the theoretical project. Uh, economic development site readiness. Council, you know this is obviously uh, top on your priority list and continuing to Think about some investments at site two, site three, or the Ke and or the Keck estate. And then also we are continuing to work with the, the state on the old city landfill. Uh, we're working with them on remediation of a pre-regulatory landfill. Uh, and that's going just fine. The state folks are, are doing a nice job for us and we're marching along there so we can make that land helpful towards an economic development site. Uh, broadband improvements, we've mentioned that multiple times this evening. Uh, PFOS monitoring, uh, again, we'd want to make our legislators aware of the ongoing concern, uh, you know, that we had a threatened lawsuit by the Hall River Assembly. We now have a letter of agreement, which we feel good about, uh, but, uh, you know, making them aware of the, the effluent into the Hall River. Uh, and then uh, I know there's also concern about land application of sludge. So just making the legislators, uh, make our legislators aware of that and to, to help us as there's no specific ask today, but there may be some asks in the future. Uh, the city occupancy tax, that's something we have talked about in the past. I uh, want to continue that conversation. And then finally, we have the, the Moorefield building renovation, the Paramount expansion. We've obviously got that on our federal list as well, if we can find something there. There had been some previous uh, legislative interest uh, in some funding for the Paramount. Uh, so we want to see if that still exists as we go forward. Uh, if there's some arts and culture funding, you know, that's around at the state level, we'd be interested in pursuing that uh, as a way to renovate the old uh, Moorefields florist uh, to usable space, which was our intent. Um, I think that's all I have on that. Rachel, what else did I leave out or anything else you'd add to those remarks? Yep, I think you've covered all the, the kind of city goal items that might require or have an opportunity for state partnership in the next biennium just to bring that awareness to our new delegation and start the conversation surrounding those topics. Um, and then also perhaps discussing the law enforcement reform piece. Yeah, I didn't add it to today's conversation, but uh, we'll do that in our session is also thanking them for uh, and showing them what we've been able to do together in the past by working together, obviously our success at City Park Creek uh, and our success at North Park Pool, et cetera. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that in the session uh, next week as well uh, and, and, and appreciate uh, what the legislature does to help us move these major goals along. Any comments from council on these goal items? I mean, it looks very much like a retreat list from three or four years ago. That's what it is. We're continuing just to chip away at these big projects. Are you good? Any, any questions, comments from council on these? No new surprises here, like Arden mentioned. So stay in the course and staying focused. So. Yep, we're gonna keep being persistent. Uh, and as I think, uh, I, I like Jennifer's wording in our earlier conversation about uh, playing the long game. All right, we just keep, uh, keep, keep them on the list and keep them aware and somebody will be in a conversation someday and something will happen. And I think we can point to North Park and know how that happened there. So maybe something will pop up for some of these others that are still, um, okay. still in need of dollars. Um, and uh, Scott Bibbler, if you'll make uh, Chief Smythe uh, pop him onto the screen too, I'm going to ask him to help me with this next section. 
uh, which talks about law enforcement reform and public safety. Um, Council, as you know, we actively, uh, Chief Smythe and our police leadership actively work with the North, North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, Mr. Fred Baggett is their lead uh, on lobbying efforts in Raleigh, uh, and he's helped us put together the list here. Chief, you want to just take the take the list and walk through this? Uh, would you like me to take a stab at that? Would you like to take the lead here? It doesn't matter. Whatever's resist. Go ahead, if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police is about uh, 150 chiefs strong across the state, and we meet regularly and obviously work to advocate for uh, things that we feel professionally are good for policing and public safety. So this is a, a short list uh, called from that group's work product. Uh, the need to have automatic license plate readers in the state right away, you know, here in Burlington, some of our, our most populated or most used roads are numbered highways that belong to the state. So we're barred currently from putting uh, license plate readers on those roadways. And we'd like the state to correct that so that we have permission to do that. As with uh, a number of uh, agencies around the state, we're not certainly the only one in that uh, bucket. Uh, certification of telecommunicators, there's some problems with that. So we're just looking for some delays there. Uh, the governor's task force has a number of proposals and there are a few that we feel aren't particularly well thought out and need some refinement. So we're going to, you know, work in that direction, um, supporting some of those that, that are attached. Uh, and then we regularly get some uh, Im impact from the PBA and FOP about a police officer bill of rights. Uh, we feel that police in North Carolina shouldn't be singled out to have uh, different rights as workers from all of the other workers in the municipality, right? So this legislation seeks to say that uh, folks who work uh, in public works or in finance get a different set of rights for employment than police officers get. We don't think that's appropriate. So we advocate that they, you know, that all municipal workers be treated the same. Um, so that's that, uh, that bullet list there. Is there another slide or is that it boss? That's all, it's going to the one. Okay, perfect. So that, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. And council members, I believe you have the, in your packet, we had the detailed information, uh, notes that Chief Smythe provided uh, that were um, through the help of the Chiefs Association to give a little more detail if you're interested. Uh, we're happy to take questions on all of the above or listen to comments, feedback. Any questions from council on these? Yeah, the, the, the permitting of the automatic license plate readers uh, is that something that you think we, uh, that the various departments and the chiefs can put uh, can try to work together and, and to attempt to get something like that passed because that that would be any about every community would it not? Yeah, it's really a, a funny situation in that, you know, if, if you drive on any of the toll roads over near Raleigh, they all use, uh, uh, you know, license plate reader technology to take a picture of your plate and right. send you a bill for the toll road, right? So right. I mean, clearly they embrace it and it exists. There's already laws on the books about uh, how long you can keep the pictures, what the criminal use are, uh, the ability to use those pictures for missing persons, uh, finding wanted felons that have, you know, warrants already issued. All of those things are already addressed. The current law is simply silent to the fact that we can uh, piggyback LPRs onto existing infrastructure on state highways. It doesn't bar it. It just doesn't allow it. So the Department of Transportation's position is we're not going to allow it until the state legislature acts to say it is expressly permitted. And so the draft legislation's in place, I think last year or the year before it passed the House subcommittee, it got held up in the Senate Transportation Subcommittee. I actually personally went and testified in front of that group at one point to explain what we thought the, uh, uh, the bona fide interest was for cities around the, the state to be able to do this. The testimony was well, well received and yet the bill didn't get traction to move out of committee. I'm not sure that it was actually ever defeated, it just didn't move. So, you know, perhaps that's something that uh, Amy Gailey can work on in, in her uh, new attendance down there. But for whatever reason, we feel like there's just a lack of movement from, I think, just the Senate. But 
as the various uh, political personalities change, you know, we might see uh, a different perspective in either one of the two sides of the uh, legislature down there. So we'll, we'll see how it goes, but you know, certainly if, if folks here advocate for that, then we can convince the legislature to move in that direction. It's really an appropriate use of technology. It's not overly intrusive. It takes a picture of a government issued license plate on your vehicle while it operates on a public roadway, right? There's not anything super secret or super revealing about this. So we feel like it ought to happen. Well, what is people's, what, what is the opposition? Uh, what, what's that focus, Jeff? There has never been anyone express plainly any opposition. That's what makes it very difficult to fight because nobody will come out really and say, we don't like it because of X. If we knew that, we'd subtly draft the, the legislation in a different way to mitigate for the negative of X, but uh, we just really don't get that. There might be some feeling of it's big brother-ish, but nobody really comes out and says a conclusive why it won't happen, it just stalls. And so uh, it's a difficult battle to fight. We've been pushing for this for uh, at least the seven years that I've been here as chief in Burlington and been involved with the Chiefs Association. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, Chief Harden, would you like council to include these on a consent agenda as well, or just just for general approval? What do you think, Rachel? If we're gonna go ahead and do that, we, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and extend that to city specific priorities in addition to the league. It gives you know, staff a little bit more confidence going forward to identify bills that, that might affect these priorities. Seems reasonable based on the other agendas as well. So council, any objection to including these on the consent agenda as well? Yeah. Thank all you right. very much. We'll uh, have all this ready and have a nice uh, clean document for you. So we're uh, for, for tomorrow, but also in, in preparation for our meeting with the delegation next week. Thank you. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you to staff for going through this process. I think it's a very important process to help us all be on the same page um, as we work with our fellow representatives at all levels of government. Look forward to a productive legislative year. So. All right, with that, we'll move on to uh, agenda item D, City of Burlington brand refresh update. And at this time, we'll recognize our community engagement uh, manager, Morgan Lasseter, welcome. Thank you. Um, so tonight, I'm just gonna go over something that um, much of our council has already um, seen and heard from me, um, but want to just review with you guys this evening, uh, brand refresh for the City of Burlington. Uh, so let me share my screen. All right, we've got that screen up. You got it? Okay, perfect. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit of background about the process. Um, since 2018, uh, even when Rachel was in the similar position as me, we have been working um, on what we're calling a brand refresh. So we worked with a local marketing firm to do a brand audit of all existing assets that are being used within the city of Burlington's organization. So as you can see from this flow chart, um, there are a lot of images out there representing our organization in the world. So uh, we did this to kind of do some discovery. Um, we also um, held four different input sessions with community members and staff members here at the city of Burlington. Um, and then had a smaller staff committee that consisted of myself, John Burden, Rachel, um, Peter, Bishop, Emily Lott uh, and Jess Aries um, that met a couple of times over the past year or so as we were developing this. So out of this discovery, we, what we already knew but really did solidify it for us as staff was that we had um, images and marks out in our community that were um, creating a bit of disconnectedness or um, not as much understanding um, with our residents and our patrons, um, that our facilities programs, um, even some of our parks were run by the city of Burlington. 
just because we have inconsistency and in imagery and brand marks out in the world. Uh, so that really did solidify for us that it was the time to pull all of that back in. Um, as a city grows and uh, things happen, um, if you don't kind of have that plan in place, that can happen easily. So it's a really, it, it, it is a challenge and it's going to be a challenge for us to kind of pull all of that back in as we have begin to understand that. So with that background, um, we did feel like it was time to come up with a more cohesive brand mark that is gonna serve us all here at the city of Burlington. So um, John and I worked um, from a lot of this information that was gathered through discovery. Um, a lot of the design, most all of the design work was done in-house um, here with staff um, and our copywriting um, also done with staff. So we really worked to try to utilize what we, the skill sets that we have um, in this department as well. So what our proposed um, brand mark is are these two variants that we're working with. Um, so we've got a horizontal variant and then we've also got um, the more compact square. Um, so this is, is what we're calling a refresh. So I'll take you through a little bit of what that evolution was so that you can kind of understand how we got to this point. Um, so as you know, the train track B was developed several years ago um, uh, and wasn't really rolled out comprehensively within the organization of the city of Burlington. Um, it kind of took legs and has been used through departments and through different programs, uh, but not with a comprehensive approach. So nothing that was strategic. Um, and it was really developed out of a website redesign and a need for something. Um, so with that, we've taken it and, and we're kind of calling it an evolution or a refresh of that mark. Um, so through that discovery, we really recognized that um, there was an opportunity here to talk about uh, a, almost a path to progress. So where railroad has historically been the imagery that's associated with company shops, Burlington, um, th that we wanted to keep kind of that semblance, but we wanted it to move a little bit forward. So as you'll see, it's progressed and it's moved so that it's actually moving to the right, um, looking like we're going somewhere. Um, so, and we've simplified the imagery. So we've taken kind of that, uh, the train track, um, the busyness of the train track and simplified that to feel a little more modern uh, for our city. And then with our colors, um, so that Burlington blue will we'll maintain, we're, we're proposing that we're gonna lose that uh, gold color. Um, as we've moved through some capital, capital infrastructure within our park system, we've had the need to go ahead and purchase signage, um, monument signage for those parks, uh, directional signage, amusement park signage. Um, and out of that, we've recognized that that park's green is something that's going to be very useful and very identifiable uh, for our city. Um, if you'll notice, it's even on the toppers of our wayfinding signage that we collaborated with the BDC to have put in through town. That that green is on the top. So we had to go out there and recognize everything was, that was already out in our world and then figure out how to kind of pull that back in. So we're proposing that those primary colors be the Burlington blue and what we're calling our park screen. Um, we've also added in some accent colors and that will be super useful for staff as we move through larger website redesigns, larger print publications where you're gonna need more than two colors. And we don't want folks going out there and just choosing what they want to choose. We want to help keep everybody in, in line. Um, so we have our Camac Blue, our Macintosh Indigo, Innovation Gray, and Connected Orange. The Macintosh Indigo and the, the Parks Green and the Burlington Blue are the primary colors in our park system signage that is already out in the world. So we're kind of using all of that to build our, our, our ingredients for our brand here. And then for fonts, um, we are proposing that we keep our Georgia font and that it will live on. Um, and then we've added in Franklin Goth, Gothic Book and Franklin Gothic Demi Condensed. So those are a little more modern sans serif fonts that we'll be able to utilize um, in different ways um, by having that secondary font. 
Morgan, it just jumped out at me. The, um, the serif on the B, uh, if you go back a few slides, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was intentional. Uh, one more. Um, so the serif on the new B versus the old B has a different radius on it. Is that mm -hmm. a, a different Georgia or was that? Well, I actually took the Georgia and traced it and then elongated it um, yeah. a little bit. So you get a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. So that was intentional. Just on, okay. And so we proposed, um, as, as you folks know, Belong in Burlington is a new resident program that was developed here. Um, and it is something that we discovered in our focus groups that uh, people were identifying the city of Burlington with the phrase Belong in Burlington. So it had kind of taken legs. Um, and as John and I were working through this project, um, it became apparent that, well, folks already were assuming it was the city's tagline. Um, and that we could embrace this phrase to help promote our events, our resident outreach, our community boards and commissions, our economic development efforts, and more. Um, obviously, we want everyone, all people, organizations, businesses, and communities to feel like they belong in Burlington. So we saw that it had a lot of pliability moving forward, um, whether we're working with Peter with economic development or we're working with REC with their programs. Um, we want everyone to belong to, to those to those things and participate. Um, and so we're still tweaking this and this is gonna take some time. Um, we're actually gonna, um, we're looking to partner again with a marketing firm to help us develop the hundreds of digital assets that will need to be deployed across the organization as we look at our departments and divisions through our staff uh, discovery. And I, I think we, we're aware of this too. Uh, folks in each department or division have a lot of ownership of their department and division and it creates a lot of employee pride that we don't want to lose. So we don't want to just roll out, this is the city's mark and that's it, you're using it. Uh, we want people to be able to keep that. We want GIS to have their GIS shirt. We want public works to have their public works cap. Um, so we are going to look to, to to tweak and, and finalize this and make sure all of our fonts are aligned properly and it, all the readability is there as we work through our departments and our divisions. Um, with that being said, we are very aware that we have some well-established and well-applied uh, departments that um, you know we're not gonna take a badge from a police officer or a, a cross from a firefighter and we don't intend to. So how do those things work together? Uh, so we, are proposing that as, as these departments are, are using their marks, that we have some opportunity here to include our uh, new B, essentially. Um, and then with fire and police, we also recognize that our animal services department, as well as our recreation and parks department has put significant investment in capital infrastructure and other marketing that they're doing really well. They have high visibility in our community and we don't wanna take that away from them either. So we recognize that the animal, cat and dog head with animal services can live on in, in marriage with our city brand. And if we're able to give staff an, you know, an exact way of how to do that, that's gonna benefit us. Um, recreation and parks. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but there was a, uh, a rectangle logo that had a leaf and a, a watermark in it. So we were able to pull that leaf out. Um, and then we're actually gonna clean that up a little bit too. If you'll see, there's some variance in the, um, in the thickness and the, and the way that points meet each other that can probably be cleaned up a little bit. So we're working to do that as well. Um, this uh, design mark will exist um, on in our park system too. It's become the thing that uh, gets used on signage, um, it's getting used on marketing material. Um, so as we're you know, finishing North Park Pool, as we're looking at the carousel, um, we're thinking about how can that leaf kind of maintain through all recreation and parks facilities. And this is just an example of our working backwards. So these things live in the world already most of them. The city park sign never came to fruition there on the right, um, but it is proposed. Um, so as you 
this kind of shows like how we've been able to, it takes a lot of time to put a project like this together. And we've had to make some decisions before we were ready to go. Um, so we've tried to be very strategic about how we've done that. Um, and then it just kind of backs up how we're using those colors. Um, so just an example of that. And then just an update on implementation. Um, like I said, John and I are working on um, finalizing and cleaning up um, and looking to partner again to help someone develop those hundreds of digital files that will need to have a robust staff rollout and education campaign across our organization. Um, we've met with purchasing and uh, they have been very amenable to helping us uh, as filter things through their department too, um, as people are ordering things. Um, as far as external rollout, um, I think it's important to mention how we're thinking about that. Um, obviously here tonight, we're talking about it. Um, and like I said, John and I are working with Civic Plus on a website redesign. Um, so that's where we see it, it kind of coming out in, it, in the biggest way initially. Um, but as we, as we roll through this, we are advising, and um, I think uh, Rachel and Harden are, are of similar thought as we do this, our advisement to staff is not to throw out everything with Railroad Track B. Um, it doesn't go in the dumpster. Um, and then new things ordered. Um, as you know, you normally had it budgeted for, you know, a, a new emblem on the side of your car or a new t-shirt or a new hat, um, you order it with the new. So the old stuff's gonna exist in the world for a little bit. And I think that that's a responsible way as a municipality to roll things out. Um, obviously we're not a private corporation where we just, you know, toss it out and start over. Um, so we're going to kind of work and it'll be a multi-year process as we begin to to kind of to, to change the things that are being used uh, in the organization. But the website really will be, we've got about six months on that project uh, to finish that up. And that really will be our biggest splash externally. Um, and then we have, we have a plan by end of winter, beginning of spring to do that staff rollout and that staff education. So I believe that's the end of my spiel. Um, but if anyone has any feedback or direction or comments, um, would love to hear it. Very good, council. Questions, feedback? I know my big question is when do we get it on a water tower? <laughs> I think we just, upped, I think we repainted our water tower not too long ago, refreshed it, but yeah, that would be good. Joe Davidson's water tower would look lovely with that be. It would look amazing. So I know yeah, I, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it getting rolled out. Our, our kids love the, the recreation signs. They just pop. And so every time we drive past a recreation facility, they're like, look, it's a pool because they associate with North Park. But uh, yeah. uh, it, it it stands out and I'm excited to see how it helps folks just like the wayfinding signs reminded folks of all the amazing things in our community. Uh, it helps remind them all the things that our, our city does in the community. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I think LabCorp is updating their logos right now. We start to see some of their new signs pop up around the community. So um, we've gotten some good ideas of how they've how they've uh, made some rollout videos and stuff um, with some of their language, even from how they're doing it. So we're trying to learn from them too. <laughs> we get a lot of fresh color moving through the community in 2021. So. All right, any other council questions, comments? Morgan, thank you to your team for this work. We're looking forward to seeing it all rolled out. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll move on to item G on our agenda, the golf course brand update. At this time, I'll recognize our Recreation and Parks Director, Tony Laws. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, it's always a pleasure to uh, speak to you, and uh, uh, certainly that is uh, true tonight. Uh, I'm sort of tying in with Morgan's previous presentation, and she'll also be on this, this presentation uh, as soon as I get through introducing it. I wanted to mention to you, uh, the little bit of a history on Indian Valley Golf Course. Uh, I know probably most of you know, maybe some of you 
forgotten or whatever. But this was a privately developed golf course uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s uh, by a developer that uh, w built a golf course and with the hopes of selling all the uh, building lots around the, the golf holes to uh, recover his uh, investment. Unfortunately, uh, half of the golf course, uh, the land didn't perk. So, uh, and there's no water and sewer available in that area. So uh, he uh, got into financial difficulty and the city was able to purchase this golf course at a very, very uh, inexpensive price, uh, $450,000 if I remember correctly, uh, back in uh, 73, 74. And uh, Indian Valley was the name of the golf course uh, when the developer created it and, and when the city bought it, it was still the name. And then we just carried forth with uh, Indian Valley as the name of the golf course. It was already established and uh, there was never any, any uh, thought about changing it back then. Um, and uh, I want to mention one other quick thing because uh, I've already had people that know about this possible change uh, question me about it. Uh, Indian um, is certainly part of the name, uh, the word Indian. And uh, I've never had, and I've been uh, here the whole time that the city has owned the golf course. I've never had a Native American uh, in this area or any area. And, and we have a lot of Native Americans in this area. And I've worked with a lot of them in different things. Never had a Native American complain about uh, the word Indian being in, in the title of the golf course. Uh, so it's not been offensive uh, to uh, the Native Americans in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So I've had people tell me, well, you're just dropping the name Indian because of political correctness. That is absolutely incorrect. That is, has nothing to do with this chain. So I want to make sure we understand stand that. And I also want to mention that uh, this change comes to you as a unanimous recommendation from my Recreation and Parks Commission. Uh, they discussed this uh, uh, subject back in uh, December uh, at a meeting and, and had the presentation and, and they were uh, uh, very positive about the change and, and uh, endorsed it very uh, enthusiastically. And so uh, it, it does come to you as a unanimous recommendation from them. Uh, so um, uh, we have a new uh, director, um, manager at the golf course, Jonathan Dudley. You'll be hearing from him shortly, and he's got some really good news that, that you're going to be happy to hear. Uh, and uh, uh, he's done a great job since he came to us in June. Uh, and so uh, uh, with the fact that we got new management and uh, the pandemic has uh, sort of uh, revived golf for a lot of people, uh, become a lot more popular in the last uh, – eight, nine months uh, nationwide, not just in Burlington or North Carolina, but nationwide. And so uh, so we got a lot of good things going for the golf course and uh, and Jonathan's one of them. And so we, we were thinking that we needed a, a fresh outlook uh, at the golf course. Uh, and um, the Valley name is uh, uh, something that people have shortened in any way, you know, they say, well, I'm going out to the Valley to play, or can you meet me out at the Valley to play? So, so th this was all, uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, part of the, the tradition out there anyway. And, and Morgan and John and the others that worked on this, uh, Jonathan, have done a great job on it. So I want to bring Morgan back in to give you a, a little uh, presentation on, on how it, the uh, Valley name evolved and, and, uh, and, and what's uh, a part of it. So Morgan, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Tony. So yeah, as as we stated before, um, as we went through the discovery process, uh, we began to recognize that we had residents and, and patrons that didn't know that uh, this golf course was a municipal golf course or that it was uh, supported or run by their tax dollars. Um, so through that discovery, as you see, um, we found inconsistency in the brand marks that were representing the golf course. Um, and we realized that probably needed to change. Um, and so with that, we also recognize that this is a commercial amenity. Um, so it's not a department or division of the city of Burlington. So it's not gonna get the same treatment. Um, so when you're developing that kind of brand mark, you wanna think about um, how you're competing in the marketplace. Um, so as Jonathan came on board and we began to have discussions about his vision and, and the new energy and excitement that he was bringing to the golf course, um, you know, we wanted to get out there and see how can we present this in a, 
maybe a more palatable or exciting way um, to the golf community. Um, and that's something that John Vernon and I are not golfers. So um, we were able to take the time to understand that and talk with Jonathan and understand his vision. Um, so we knew that we had the larger city brand coming uh, on board too. And we wanted those two to at least resemble one another so that you could tell that they were from the same family of brands. Um, so with that, um, this is the mark that we have come up with. Um, and like Tony said, um, kind of in discovery, I think even for Jonathan coming on board, we began to understand that in the vernacular of everyday talk, it was almost referred to as the Valley by many of its patrons. Um, so we thought that was a good opportunity for um, something that felt a little more contemporary, um, to kind of capitalize on the new energy that was happening in golf. Uh, we also recognize that it's one of the few golf courses that is on the Hall River in our area. Um, so we felt like that was a uniqueness that we would be able to capitalize on in marketing as well. Um, so golf by the river being kind of our tagline that we're proposing. Um, we also recognize that um, there were going to be some more opportunities um, because it is a municipal golf course that has the river, has the hiking trails, has the ability for people to come out there and use it not just for golf, but for recreation. Um, so we're kind of saying a secondary tagline that we want to use in the marketing is going to be that everybody plays at the Valley. So you can go out there and play in different ways. Um, and we also recognize I think something that Jonathan figured out pretty quickly was that this golf course attracted folks that every age, every body um, from many courses, I think he had come from, you kind of had a certain demographic, but we, because we are so accessible, we serve everybody, um, which is something really cool and something that we want to, that we're proud of and we want to say. Um, so as you see, we mocked up some ways that this logo could be used on apparel and hats. Um, and I think Jonathan's dreaming up ideas too. So I think that's the end of my section. And I think uh, now Jonathan's gonna share a little bit with you guys about kind of his vision and where we are now as a golf course. Awesome, well, thank you, Morgan. And uh, thanks for inviting me in tonight. Um, I'm excited by everything that Morgan and uh, her and John have done to this point in time. Uh, it's cool to see Morgan how you really, you know, built this story and put this together. Um, certainly, you know, I'm looking at it through the perspective of the golf course, but uh, it's cool to see the B and the branding and how that has such a cool flow to it. And uh, it, it's just exciting to see. And I uh, echo. Uh, the mayor's, um, you know, kids being excited about seeing those colors too. Uh, you know, we hang out at the park a lot and I have a five-year-old son and uh, those colors really do catch your eye. So, uh, so it's exciting. Um, so where are we with this golf course? Um, it's, uh, it's been exciting to see. I think, again, we go to the spectrum of golfers. Um, as some of you may know, Alamance Country Club was closed this year for a redesign and we had a lot of Alamance uh, Country Club golfers come over and actually play our golf course, which, uh, you know, these are members that pay a pretty substantial monthly fee, but are willing to, without any reciprocal, come and play our golf course uh, quite a bit. So, um, you know, I thought that really boded well for us. Uh, also, um, it's been amazing to see how the spectrum of golfers from young to old um, and just from just different demographics, um, you know, economically, uh, certainly um, come and, and play this golf course. Um, so being here for six months, um, that's something as I've been talking with Morgan that I, I re was really hoping that we would capture. Um, obviously, we have First Tee here and they're doing great stuff for our youngsters, but we want to, you know, continue to uh, show how um, how much opportunity there is uh, for this golf course for, for players of all skill levels too. And uh, that's some things that um, golf can be extremely intimidating. Um, but uh, you're seeing a lot of these golfers come out here and uh, 
whether they're, you know, skipping it off the front of the first tee box or uh, they're bombing it down the middle, um, they seem to still be enjoying themselves. So, um, so that's exciting. Um, Morgan, can I, can we go to the next slide? So how are we doing as far as sales? Well, golf in general, um, I can't say worldwide, but the National Golf Foundation has done a study and they've estimated about golf is up about 30 to 35 percent um, this year. Um, we're going to look at quarters one and quarters two as far as how we're doing at Indian Valley. And again, um, taking information um, that has been recorded through our uh, point of sale system and uh, based on last year's numbers as well. Um, and so you can see the numbers are pretty staggering. So nationwide, we're looking 30 to 35 percent. And uh, these are the numbers that we see in 2020 for quarters one and two versus last year's numbers. So this, is, compared to, this is above last year. So 98 yeah, more. Explain those numbers. Yeah. The, the increases over last year's numbers, Harold. Okay. Um, the okay. percentage, the percentage this of year uh, versus uh, last year comparison of yes. revenue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it and, is pretty strong. And this is revenue or T's or these are just monthly sales. Monthly Re sales. Revenue. Revenue. Yep. Revenue. And that includes total, that includes uh green fees, cart fees, uh concessions, driving range, driving range. Okay. Everything. This is just a total of, uh, yep. of the revenue memberships. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are we still doing the annual memberships out there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh. We don't have as many take care take advantage of that anymore, but we do still have some. So, to me, these numbers are staggering. I've never seen anything like that. So. Um, it's incredible to see the growth of golf. So if we can go to the next slide, Morgan. Um, round analysis, again, this is using our point of sale system. So some of that uh, does have to, um, I've, again, I've been here for six months. So some of this, you know, depending on how it's entered into our system. Um, but I went back, uh, um, and, uh, back until 2016 and tried to look at our different rounds. So it's, we can speculate that the rounds um, from 2016 to 2019 were probably a little bit higher, but you can still notice a substantial increase already in 2020. And this includes members, um, you know, uh, every, every play, we try to capture as much data as possible, obviously with a point of sale system. So that can capture, you know, membership rounds. So even though they're not paying anything that day, we're still capturing the round. Um, and so here's some of the data that we have to be able to show you where we're at. It's good to be able to look at data points like that. The same thing with, the, although we haven't had any schools play uh, in uh, 2020, uh, but they would have schools pay a flat fee. So their rounds would be counted as a, uh, a round that, you know, that we don't actually get a, a green fee or a cart fee on. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And, and I'm excited as well with a new point of sale system that we're bringing into the golf course. It's going to be a be better opportunity to continue to make sure that we're capturing this data accurately because it really helps us to, you know, forecast out for our future and, uh, you know, give the right type of information and, and statistical analysis that you guys can have to uh, to kind of paint the picture a little bit more with numbers. Jonathan, my screen, I, I, what's the 2020 number? 22,670. Okay, thank you. That's a strong number, guys, for a number of years there, I can tell you. Hopefully that line there that's on an angle, diagonal angle, go, will keep going up and, uh, and we'll have good, uh, good figure to show you coming, coming months and years. So Morgan, can we go to the last slide, please? I think. Um, all right. So uh, can everyone kind of see over here on the right side? Um, if you kind of move our heads a little bit to the center of the screen, you see this guy here with a red shirt. 
Anybody yeah. know who that guy is? He's got his fist in the air. Can everybody see him? Oh, Tiger Woods, yeah. Oh, Ian knows who he is. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, kind of a big deal, right? So golf in general, right, since Tiger won the Masters. And, Tony, what what was the first year Tiger won the Masters? Um, gee whiz, this, uh, it was a long time ago, uh, 95 maybe? 97. 97. Pretty close. Okay. But we haven't seen numbers like this in the golf industry basically since the mid-90s. When everyone decided to, you know, build golf courses and the National Golf Foundation said that actually golf was, you know, uh, they were trying to build golf courses as fast as golfers were picking up their clubs, basically. So um, we're excited about this trend in the industry. Obviously, we're an outdoor sport. Um, you know, thankfully for us, um, we are an outdoor sport and we're able, we're able to offer a lot of opportunities for people who are going through a lot right now in our community. However, um, we also want to make sure we can kind of ride this wave into generations to come. So this is really a great opportunity for us to capture this generation of golfers and to really help them grow and progress in their game and, you know, see Indian Valley as a great place to bring, you know, their kids or their grandparents and uh, just make it more of a just kind of a, a fresh and fun way to, to play the game of golf. So I say let's join the comeback tour. You know, Tiger won the Masters last year. We're trending in the right direction with golf. Why not a beautiful logo and a fresh look? Well, it sounds like we're headed in the right direction for that. Yes, it looks it looks great. So thanks, Morgan, for for your creativity, and uh, yeah, thanks for letting me present tonight. Jonathan, it, 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 the the logo looks great. Though. Just just a question: with the twenty two thousand rounds this year, uh, and still with bent grass greens, uh, what that uh, with that amount of play, what kind of impact did it have on the greens? Let's say starting probably late July, early August. Yeah, so given the fact that we had a real wet spring, um, you know, uh, sometimes when you have those wet spring and you get on those greens, uh, it's tough to get the root structure maybe as strong as we wanted. So by the end of August, we did see that those greens were pretty stressed out. Um, yeah. However, by, you know, towards the end of September, beginning of October, we did see a pretty good turnaround. And honestly, even though um, maybe in your better golfers opinion the greens weren't as as strong as they needed to be it really didn't slow down that much even when we had the greens aerated personally i was shocked at how many people still play golf out here so for your golfers obviously like we said we have a wide spectrum of golfers but there's a lot of golfers that play out here that just enjoy playing golf out here and again i was shocked that for those of you who aren't golfers aeration aerated greens are really what you try to avoid like the plague most of the time. <laughs> if you're a golfer, you just don't want to play on aerated greens and on bent greens. You need to do that for the healthiness of the grass. Um, so even when we weren't at our best, we still had a lot of golfers that wanted to play our course. Well, that's a real compliment to the golf course and, and to you guys operating it. Jonathan, how are you seeing more people, certainly younger people? I'm reading a lot about, sort of how trends are changing, but are you seeing more and more people just play nine holes? Is that, is that trend starting to take on here? Um, you know, it, th there are some nine holers. I think, you know, especially more of your novice players. Um, certainly uh, a lot of your college students are getting out of uh, school a little bit later. Um, there is a little bit of that. Um, there's definitely, uh, I think that's a great way to start. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming for most of your golfers that get started to go out and spend four hours, four and a half hours playing a game they don't really know how to play. So um, I think there's definitely, you know, the PGA of America has tried to push, you know, just play nine. Um, and, you know, our golf course sets up pretty well for that as, as well. Um, so. I think that will become more popular, uh, the, uh, the nine hole, uh, rounds. Uh, so, uh, because of people's time, but, uh, 
still a lot of people like to play 18 when they go out. Yeah, there's some other phrases like play it forward, you know, like a, you don't have to hop on the back tees. I mean, um, there's also a, a something called Operation 36 now for youth where you actually start at the green and your goal is to, you know, go around uh, and play and try to, you know, hit 36 uh, starting with putting. And it could be from 20 feet away. And you just, you know, two putt or three putt and then go to the next hole. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to engage uh, golfers to the game. And uh, I think that's what I'm most excited about uh, at this golf course is it, it gives people of all skill level an opportunity to play the game. And I think there's a lot that we can do to grow the game in, in Alamance County, because like I said, there's just so many people from so many different walks of life playing it right now. The, the tees are, are important because uh, every golfer should – learn to play from the tees where their game fits. Uh, I'm a senior player now, and I would never even consider playing on the uh, regular men's tees and much less the back tees. I mean, you know, it just wouldn't be any fun. And so I hope that people will come out there and take advantage of the number of tees we have so that they can, their game fits whatever yardage they're playing and they'll have a lot more fun doing it. Dama, how do you do that? The 36, the, you know, with the kids starting around the greens, which is a great idea for young kids. That's wonderful. How does that fit in in terms of your normal play uh, in the flow of your normal play? Is that just done at certain times or? How, how yeah, do do that's that? how some courses have done it. And we haven't instituted that. Uh, we actually do something called Grow Golf Now, which is four holes at four o'clock on Sundays. Um, so four holes at four o'clock, um, we take actually this year, we had to limit it due to COVID, but we limited it to 25 young people. And uh, my son was actually involved in this one, but we team up with Aaron Davis from the city of Mebane. Um, We helped get this program started at Mill Creek. And uh, the four holes was kind of cool because, you know, mom, dad, or whoever you want caddies for you. And uh, you go and you play four holes. And in our situation, we basically split number one and half. We put a hula hoop around the pin, and uh, that was hole one. And then they hit from another, you know, cone tee box from the fairway to the green, which actually had the hole in it. So that was a little bit more difficult. And then we split number two at Indian Valley in half two. So they literally only played two holes, but uh, they played four holes within those two holes. That's and, great. Uh, that, that's great. Yeah, and if they were better, you know, they could they could go ahead and, and play more of the full length course, but. Again, the, the whole thought there is uh, exposure, mom or dad is caddying, and, and there really wasn't an instructional component at all. It was, we would, uh, Aaron actually created some, some fun little videos, but he also would, you know, send out these weekly updates like, hey, what's cool to wear on the golf course? And, um, and he's kind of a golf geek, so he has all sorts of different golf apparel and it was it's just kind of a fun way to introduce people to the game who are investigating it and i would say our average age was probably eight and i've uh, watched, w watched that several times and and that is a very uh family affair very uh good uh you know young kids and their parents and and uh, certainly we want to and keep uh going with that and encourage them because these young kids they're our uh players of the future well, and in doing that, it doesn't intimidate them. So the courses, is, you know, for young kids, it's hard. They get intimidated really easy. So it, it makes it more fun. That, that's a great way to start. Yeah, I have a five-year-old that, you know, takes takes after his mom, highly energetic, um, you know, a little bit more of the composed one or maybe less energetic. And uh, I was nervous, but he actually, he actually did it, and his mom actually caddied for him. So I was just a spectator which is a little difficult, but, uh, you know, she, she doesn't really play golf and it was, it was kind of neat to see how they were still able to plot along. Um, and, and that was his first time ever doing that. Um, I, I was just hoping, you know, he was, he wasn't going to get too out of control, but, uh, he did really good with, uh, with kids, his age, he had, you know, three other boys that were his age. They were all five years old and, uh, they plotted around those four holes. So, well, Tony, Morgan, Jonathan, we appreciate the update. Um, we've got a couple other items on the agenda. So, uh, Mayor, if I could say one other word, if uh, 
if the council uh, is willing, uh, would you consider putting this on uh, the consent agenda uh, tomorrow evening's meeting? Uh, is that the approval of the logo? Yes, sir. I think specifically, I'm sorry, Tony, just to add on, um, our, the logo redesign is, is more of an update and to get your questions and provide feedback um, and respond to that. But I think the idea of taking the name from Indian Valley eventually to the Valley, again, like Morgan described in the prior presentation as a multi-year process where we dual brand and, and dual advertise for quite some time, but eventually move to consolidating the graphic image with the name of the course. We do think that um, we would like to see that on the consent agenda if the council is amenable to that. For 25, for 25 years, there were two names of golf courses. It was the Valley and the Rock. <laughs> the Valley and the Rock. It was never Shamrock in Indian Valley. It was the Valley and the Rock. You got that right. Yep. Providing that consistency there as far as graphic logos and, and the moniker, of course, realizing that would be a, a strategic process over several years. Any objection to including that um, logo and name change on tomorrow night's consent agenda? Uh, great. Well, we appreciate that presentation. It's good to know we've got uh, innovative and creative minds that work on this project and we're already reaping the rewards from that. It is uh, seven o'clock and as per usual, after about two hours of this meeting, we'll take a quick five minute break before we continue on to item F on our agenda. So we'll resume in five minutes. Thank you, Jonathan. Good job with your presentation. Thank you, sir.
All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and come back into session. Give folks a moment to flip videos back on. Next on our agenda is item F, Police Department Lead the Way update. At this time, I'd like to recognize Police Chief Jeff Smythe. Uh, good evening, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want to apologize maybe for being kind of late in the night and taking more than just a couple of minutes, but I've got some, I think, remarkable content. I want to share that with each of you. Uh, you know, my role at times is to be a huge cheerleader for the police department. I'm incredibly proud of the work of my staff, and I want to be able to arm you all with this data so that you can uh, you know, kind of champion the cause. When people say defund the police, I want all of us to be able to say, no, we don't need to defund the police. We're working on the right priorities and we're moving in the right directions. And the title of the presentation is, you know, BPD leading the way. And I feel like we are. And so that's going to be the, the theme I'll share with you uh, for the next little bit. Let me work on uh, sharing my screen um, and hopefully get the right one up so that you all can see that. All right, we've got that presentation. Okay, great. So just a couple of data points to start, kind of an overview. I want to talk about our accomplishments. I'm going to speak about use of force, a little bit on crime suppression, some data about our diversity, our recruitment plan, our agency focus on wellness, and then kind of looking forward what we have planned uh, for the agency in the next year or so. So those will be kind of the overview points. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on this chart. Let me uh, explain. I think, can, can you see my cursor when I move that around? Yes, we can. Perfect. So the top part here in black is basically accomplishments. The red font, as you can see, are training improvements. I'm not going to cover as I go back over this, you know, every single line. I could probably talk for an hour about this chart. I certainly won't do that. Uh, staffing changes over time key awards that have been received by the agency and staff. Uh, and then at the bottom in blue here, I call these stabilizers, things that create stability over time for the police department to ensure that we're moving in a, in a progressive direction. Uh, accreditation is one of those key things, our leadership plan, our strategic plan that has a public input, input infusion every three years. And then the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing is another key document that lends stability to policing efforts um, you know, across America. And then the last thing over here on the right-hand side, the three blue bubbles are the, the focal points or the kind of vision statement for the next year, right? When you have the whole team swinging or pulling in the same direction, then you get extraordinary accomplishments, right? So the command staff a few weeks ago solidified these three bubbles as our as our looking forward view, and, and we'll come back to those uh, during the, the rest of the presentation. So when I talk about accomplishments here across time, starting in 2015, we created ANET, the Alamance Narcotics Enforcement Team, huge impact on the drug trafficking trade here in, in Burlington and Alamance County, uh, formed the Gang and Violent Crime Unit. We implemented our first law enforcement crisis counselor and I'll just point out, we did that in 2016. Just now in 2020, people are saying we ought to have crisis counselors work with crisis counselors work with the police. And we started that program in 2016. So again, we're leading the way across uh, the state and in our industry. And there'll be several other examples of what that looks like. Uh, we made the police officer physical ability test mandatory in 2016. We started that initiative in 2014. I've had great successes there. Uh, additional units added, the crime analysis unit, crime scene investigators, the community engagement team. We, we added a, a community resource officer. Uh, here in 2020, we added a youth diversion program. And then uh, not internal, but externally facing, of course, now in 2021, in the next month or so, we'll be forming and, and seating the first members of the community, advisory, community police advisory team. Uh, Training, mark, uh, training improvements are a, a mainstay for us in everything that we do in the police department. This is why we have a, a safe police department. This is why 
you know, perhaps there's another presentation that Mr. Huffman could do downrange just to talk about the lack of civil suits that are brought against this police department because we don't make many mistakes. We don't violate people's constitutional rights. We don't get sued very much. We have a very low settlement rate if you look at, at industry standards. And I attribute that to council approving and then the police department implementing scenario-based, very forward-thinking training programs that create confident and competent police officers. Uh, that's what we see happening here in the Burlington Police Department. Uh, a couple of key awards here. In 2016, we were the runners-up of the DOJ Valor Award, and then we won that award in 2017. When we were the runners-up in 2016, we lost to the NYPD. I looked the other day, and I think they have either a seven or a 10 billion dollar budget for their police department and we lost to them all right so uh, we got to be doing something right and then we came back the next year and won and so the valor award is a doj award that's created to enhance officer safety and wellness in police departments across america and celebrate their successes there are 18,000 police departments in america all of them eligible for this award and the Burlington Police Department won the award for the Comprehensive Officer Safety and Wellness. We didn't win the award for the state of North Carolina. We won the award for the entire country. And we continue to leverage that with recruitment of candidates to talk about how well we treat our employees. Uh, another very significant accomplishment for us was the One Mind Pledge, which is a program of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, we were the third agency in North Carolina to reach this uh, milestone recognition for how we treat uh, mental health calls. Uh, our level of training and preparation and policy and interaction with community members is stellar. And so we were the third uh, in the state and the 31st in the entire country to meet the IACP's One Mind Pledge uh, criteria. So uh, with that, I'll kind of take a deep breath. And do you have any questions about anything you see on the chart that isn't either self-explanatory or you'd like me to drill in any deeper? Any questions? Okay, great. I'll uh, keep moving then. Uh, just a couple of additional accomplishments that aren't really on that chart, but I wanted to share with you. For the last three years, we've cleared 100% of our murder investigations. I'm very proud of the investigative staff that, that manage that. Uh, and then we work very closely with DEA, the Drug Ad Enforcement Administration, and they indicate that we have one of the top, if not the top drug unit in all of North Carolina as an integrated countywide uh, drug enforcement team that conducts uh, remarkable high-level investigations um, with very large seizures of drugs and, and entire operations of uh, drug trafficking organizations taken down by, by our staff really across the state. So. Uh, we have uh, the lieutenant is a Burlington lieutenant and key staff from Burlington are very active in ANET and we're, we're proud of their accomplishments. Let's shift gears and talk about use of force. So, um, you know, all of the things on that chart and that we are going to continue to talk about are really predicated by um, historical events, right? In, in August of 2014, uh, Ferguson, Michael Brown uh, incident happened. Uh, then in 2015, the 21st Century Policing Report came out. That um, was based on the outcomes from the DOJ report on Ferguson. Uh, we started to do public facing strategic planning in 2015, uh, and then the impact of accreditation for over 30 years. Those things all kind of coalesce over time and drive the decision making of the police department. So in 2015, we knew we needed to respond to uh, police de-escalation uh, attempts and, and training protocol. And so we adapted, we sent people to this ICAT training, integrating communications assessment and tactics, uh, and then brought that back, which we, as you can see on the slide, implemented in 2016. Uh, crisis intervention team training, uh, we started in 2015. That's the 40 hour class to help us deal with folks in crisis, uh, mentally ill folks. Uh, and so we know historically that there are a number of uh, tragic outcomes across the country when dealing with the mentally ill and that when you have properly trained officers, uh, they're able to reduce the uses of force. Uh, in 2017, we added a, a primary driver for our police department, which was the sanctity of all life. Uh, and then as you saw on the other slide, we've gotten uh, 
significant investments in the interactive scenario-based training that we do. So all of these changes over time have resulted in a pretty significant um, and clear decrease in the number of uses of force. Um, our arrests are, are fairly stable. This is a small data set, so it's not 100% reliable, of course, um, given the small numbers included here. Uh, but generally, when you look at this, you see not an increase in use of force, but a pretty clear um, gradual decrease in use of force. And we think that's as a result of uh, the training that we conduct. <clears throat> For crime suppression, uh, you know, in 2016, we had a very high pro profile murder. Um, we created the Gang and Violent Crime Unit. They're on point now to conduct most of our murder investigations along with some of the other detective staff. They do a fantastic job. In 2017, we implemented intelligence-led policing. That's data-driven. That's using uh, the numbers and geospatial mapping to adjust uh, police protocol and responses uh, geographically and from a database perspective to work smarter, not harder. Um, and that's been very effective for us. Uh, clean data campaign. Uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So your data, as you analyze it, is always only as good as the data coming in the front door. So we continue to have a process to scrub that data and make sure it's as timely and accurate at the time of collection as we can make it. That's been successful for us. Community engagement team has been deployed in hotspot neighborhoods. And then here in 2020, we implemented what's called the NC4 Street Smart uh, software product. It helps us with internal collaboration and then data management. So all of those are uh, drivers. I think in October, we pushed out some crime data to council. Uh, you were able to digest that a few months ago. And uh, you know we continue to have some violent crime, but we're pretty, pretty effective in managing and mitigating those circumstances across the city. Uh, any questions on the last couple of slides? Great. Transitioning now to uh, uh, data on our diversity. So I'm gonna leave this up for a minute if you just kind of take a moment to drill into that. Um, so between 2016 and 2020, over the last four years, uh, you can see the increase in diversity in almost every measurable category. Um, and I have some conversation over the last year with Jamie Joyner, our HR director, and Nicole Smith, the assistant director over there. And uh, you know, it, it, it's not just about ticking boxes, but I think it is to some extent. Uh, in the police department, we're maybe one of, if not the only uh, department in the city that has every single measurable EOC box um, checked. Our recruitment efforts are um, uh, really broad sweeping and we um, you know, have encouraged to apply and then onboard and maintain as employees a very diverse workforce and that helps us um, to be a better police department in our community. So dramatic increase in uh, officers of color and female officers. Our female officer population is just about 75% higher than the national average. So we're doing a remarkable job in, in almost all of these categories. Uh, some of the most recent uh, publications and data on recruiting would suggest that you as council members have a terrific voice in being supportive of police. We see some larger cities where Council members and mayors are highly critical of their police department and not supportive of their police department. And I think when prospective candidates hear uh, city council members and government officials talk about the credibility and trust and hard work of their uh, police department, the high level of training, the movement in a positive direction on diversity data, those are things when spoken out loud become great commercials for recruitment and help us draw in yet even more diverse candidates. So there's a hidden ask in there uh, as we look at diver uh, diversity and recruitment and retention. Uh, this slide depicts our recruitment numbers. This is total applicants as captured in the online uh, application software, NeoGov. Uh, I can't quite explain that dip in 18 and 19, but we feel like the increase in 2020 uh, is a result of uh, a renewed or an increased effort on our part to use social media advertisements. Uh, a little bit of a two-edged sword. We do feel like we have some impact of less than qualified candidates who are forced to apply for jobs based on unemployment status. 
And so they're really not viable candidates. They just have to turn in applications. And so some of the online application uh, churn is, is driven by that. And there's another slide that conveys that uh, here in a different way. Uh, so these are the applicants that we've hired. The decreases 18, 19, and 20 simply reflect uh, a, a lower quality of applicant pool that the, the highly qualified candidates aren't choosing to become involved in law enforcement like they were uh, a number of years ago. And then this next slide again, uh, we have to look now at 41 applications to find one good candidate. Whereas just a year ago, we would find one good candidate out of 17. So you see that's a very dramatic reduction in the quality of the candidates in the broader pool that are applying to be police officers. Uh, and our benchmarking with other entities in North Carolina and around the country uh, reflects some similar numbers to this. Uh, so we don't feel like we're an outlier with this. Everybody across the country is experiencing a, a decrease in the quality of their applicants, which makes finding uh, the most professional candidates a, a challenging task. Questions about diversity or recruitment at all? Okay, uh, last, last couple of slides. So uh, from a, a fitness and wellness perspective, um, in 2013, we put some folks on notice about our move to uh, POPAT testing. POPAT again stands for Police Officer Physical Ability Test. Uh, we created and opened the gym in October of 13. Uh, we made POPAT mandatory for new hired officers, uh, effective immediately <laughs> hiring. And then we gave the kind of grandfathered group of officers uh, almost three years to get in shape and prepare for and then pass the, the POPAT test. And I'll tell you that program for us, that wellness program, fitness program has been remarkably successful. Um, five, six years ago, we would have as many as eight, 10 or 12 people on what we call transitional duty. That's kind of the injured reserve status where they work in the office and maybe take phone reports or work in the evidence area, whatever their uh, medical capacity is they're able to do. Um, and we went from a regular status of 10 or 12, and now we have two or three or four employees uh, on transitional duty. And we draw from that that we're healthier, we heal faster, we get injured less often, and then we manage those injuries appropriately through the uh, assertive work of the occupational health uh, clinic. <clears throat> and so that's, uh, that's, we're spending our money wisely when we're getting people back to work quickly. Uh, that's in, a good investment in taxpayers' dollars. So um, that's our, our fitness and wellness effort just from a, a gym and a health standpoint. Uh, transition that on this slide to some conversation about uh, mental health and wellness. Uh, in 2015, we created a more robust uh, peer support team. We included a, a mandatory element of critical incident stress debriefing after critical incidents. Um, you know, child injuries, drownings, um, uh, significant shooting events, those kinds of things. All of the staff involved now participate in these critical incident debriefings, and we feel that's uh, helpful for their long-term mental health. Uh, in 2018, we created a, a quarterly mandatory visit for our SVU Special Victims Unit detectives. Those are the ones dealing with child crimes and uh, sexual assaults, the uh, the, the most serious things we could do, right? And so we created a program for them to see a counselor every quarter to just decompress and talk about the stress of the job. Um, and now beginning in January, we're gonna roll that out to the entire organization, reinforce the use of the EAP and the availability of these uh, training, uh, excuse me, uh, sessions with, with a counselor. Uh, and we think that's gonna be helpful for uh, maintaining employees, right? Kind of our attrition rate should come down a little bit as we continue to take care of the mental, emotional, spiritual health of our employees. And as you saw on the bubble chart on slide three, fitness and wellness, health of our employees continues to be one of the primary drivers for this police department moving forward. As we slide into just where are we going next, a couple of really exciting opportunities for us. We're uh, in a fledgling partnership with UNCG. Uh, they're, uh, in the process of applying for a grant, which is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to come alongside of us and study our law enforcement crisis counselor program. It's a grant from the evidence-based policing program, which is a nationwide <laughs> consortium to not talk about best practices absent evidence. So this will create, hopefully, if it comes to fruition, uh, a random study 
of the application of our law enforcement crisis counselor program and then be able to extrapolate that nationwide for other agencies to learn from what we're doing here in Burlington. Uh, a second partnership with the University of Chicago uh, and the Research Triangle Institute um, studying calls for service. How do we use our telecommunicators in the dispatch center to do the best, most robust screening of calls and then separate out non-police calls and push those to the appropriate social resources so that the police officers with guns and badges can do the more critical public safety work that really they're well positioned to do and have other qualified people do the things that they're qualified to do. Uh, this RTI project uh, is looking deeply at that with agencies across Wake County, uh, Burlington, and some other entities in North Carolina. And we're uh, you know, leading the way with that research as well. Uh, I already spoke about our quarterly EAP visits uh, for all employees. We're rolling out a, a citywide recruitment incentive program. Uh, it's important, right? A anybody that works for uh, Bob in the water department or Tony in Parks and Rec, if you bump into somebody at a business and, and you think they're gonna be a, a great police officer or a great firefighter, then we're gonna have this uh, recruitment bonus program identified so that those folks can make a referral, uh, talk up the city, guide them into the, the uh, application process. And then at several benchmarks over a period of year, they would get a bonus for recruiting that employee into uh, the police department or fire department. And that program is available citywide to any city employee, uh, absent, you know, like uh, department heads and, and HR staff. They're, they're not, you know, going to get a bonus for doing their job. So uh, that's how it's structured. Uh, coming up in 2021, we're, we're ready for the next three year cycle of public facing strategic planning. Uh, we'll look to do that in the fall, hopefully, when uh, there's a higher vaccination rate and uh, some of the COVID stuff has died down and, and we can do that uh, perhaps in. in uh, uh, on-site meetings, but if not, we'll use this uh, public platform as well. And then uh, as we've been talking about for several months, we're very excited about the creation of the community police advisory team. And, and I personally look forward to some great ideas that they'll generate that will help continue to move us forward in a progressive professional way um, so that we can continue to be one of the very best police departments in North Carolina. Uh, that's our goal. Um, some of the staff, just to put a name to some of our initiatives, right? Um, uh, we think that uh, finding and hiring and training local talent is the best way to go for longevity. And so I've got uh, two highlight uh, case studies here. Will Steele has been with us about uh, three and a half years now, I think. Graduate of Williams High School, attended Elon University, played football. Um, good cop. He's in our training section right now. He wants to be the chief. When he got hired, I think I put him behind the desk here and took a picture of him so he knows what it would feel like. And uh, he's welcome to come get the job in a couple of years. Not just yet. He's got to wait a little while. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I get to stay in the desk for a little while longer. We'll see. Uh, and then uh, Braylon Haith. He's a graduate of Cummings, went into the Marine Corps for eight years. Uh, super guy. Uh, that's his son with him when he was getting sworn in. He grew up in Tucker Street. Wendy Jordan was his mentor. Uh, helped him stay on the right, uh, you know, the right side of things and, and uh, go and get his uh, education and experience in the Marine Corps. And now he's back and, and he wants nothing more than to go back into Tucker Street and be the role model for other kids. Um, just fantastic. And I could put 20 or 30 of my cops all on this and, and, and uh, really champion how great they are because we've got remarkable staff. We've got fantastic tenured staff that stay and do great work. We've got good staff that promote through the ranks at, at all levels. And then we got these new kids coming into the, into the career uh, that are going to do really amazing things moving forward. So it's an exciting time for me as the chief. It's, uh, I think, an exciting time for the agency as we continue to be leaders. And uh, we look for your continued support year in and year out as we uh, continue to grow the number of staff, the diversity of our staff, and, uh, and the training programs that we employ to keep the police officers safe. That's my spiel. Uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer for you. Very good, thank you, Chief. Any questions, members? I wanna thank you, Chief, for that. That grid chart that you showed early on was very helpful and uh, I didn't realize we'd earned so many awards and uh, it's a nice summary of those 
those achievements and your focus areas. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to save a copy of that one. To, yeah, to please, cover. please do it. It's a neat chart. We're very proud of what we've done. So thank you all very much for your time this evening. I did have one question for you, Chief. You talked a lot about um, diversity hiring and some of your uh, strategic recruiting practices. I was curious if you've found opportunities to, to help with diversity hiring throughout the, the entire city uh, or applying some of those same strategies elsewhere. Yeah, so at Harden's direction and with uh, Jamie Joyner at the table, we have what we call the, the core group, and we're looking to uh, study the issues with regards to that and certainly share those practices across the organization. Uh, Fire Chief Jay Mebin and I meet just about every week to talk about kind of parallel directions for police and fire as, as we move forward in a, in a professional sense. He and I have a great partnership in that respect. Um, yeah, I think that... Uh, uh, Jamie and Nicole and their staff are incredibly professional and we work with them regularly to try to advance these concepts uh, across uh, the entire city organization. Very good. And one, one, one Jeff, let me ask you, we, we always used to talk about the, the uh, five year burnout time when an officer was about four or five years to determining, making a decision with their family that they want to do this or not. It's a tough, sure. it's a tough career that that's obviously still present and, and also, uh, I, I want to, to congratulate Jeff on, on a process that he implemented. Um, there in the past used to be a situation where uh, we would get officers as uh, uh, our school resource officers and they would be, stay in that role for a substantial period of time. And to be very, very, very honest, that created some, uh, some problems within our department because some people wondered uh, that why they didn't have to go through various positions in terms of their operations. In other words, they weren't on the street very much. Now, obviously being in a school resource is a tough job too, but he's put up, uh, I think, a, I believe you still got this, Jeff, the initiative where you rotate people in and out of those positions. So everyone has the opportunity to kind of uh, be part of the total uh, police department experience. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, and it's not just limited to school resource officers. It's it's almost every assignment across the police department. Here, just just this week, an example of this in play. So Kevin King was a detective for many years. We put this policy into place. It's basically a five-year rotation, and then you have to come back to the road, wear the uniform again, kind of get grounded in public safety and calls for service and police response, and then you can test for another uh, assignment again. So Kevin King's been back out on the road uh, since May, I believe. And uh, we had a series of crimes and he was able to, to be called in by the patrol sergeant and leverage his detective experience for many years as a patrol officer, interview the suspect, gain a confession, close a bunch of cases. And then all these baby cops that work around him, they're like sponges, right? And they're learning everything that he knows. And then they're gonna go be a detective in two years. So for the millennials we hire, they wanna have an impact now. They don't wanna wait eight years to get to be a detective or an SRO or 10 years. So we, you know, there are those few isolated folks who get disgruntled and say, well, I wanted to do that for 20 years. We've literally had SROs and other positions where people have been in there for 17 and 15 and 13 years. And that's just too long, right? You, you have to be uh, cross-pollinated. And so we're doing that now. And for, uh, you know, 95% of the organization, it's healthy. Um, it, it really is a great addition to what we're doing um, and, and it helps us. So thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Again, right. thank you. Appreciate it, Chief. Thank you. Go ahead and move on to item G, our advanced metering program update. At this time, I'd like to recognize Water Resources Director, Bob Patterson. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, let me share my screen here. All right, we've got that screen share up. Okay, is that a full screen? Yep. Okay. Um, Tonight, um, I'll just briefly run through uh, this project, kind of where we, why we started it, what we've done, um, the request for proposal process that we've undertaken, um, talk a little bit about the 
proposed vendor that we've uh, selected to negotiate with and uh, where, where the project would head after that. So the, the reasons why we started this advanced metering infrastructure uh, project was to uh, multifaceted, um, a major aspect would be to eliminate manual meter reading. Our current process, um, we have a couple different um, uh, meter reading technologies, either uh, a handheld reader that uh, you more or less have to uh, physically touch the meter box to catch the reading and it's transferred or we have a few uh, a, a small percentage of meters that we can drive by and collect the data. And then there's a large percentage where our meter readers still remove the lid, physically read the, the dial and key it into their keypad, which, which um, there's a potential for, for miskeying and, and creates a, a need for rereading uh, meters. So that would eliminate a lot of that and make it more efficient um, and, and improve the overall efficiency of the, of the whole meter reading process. Um, and, and it would also enhance customer service. Um, there's a customer portal that would be part of this project where customers um, could have near real time uh, within a day or two access to their uh, water consumption data. Currently, um, water that's used today may be billed, maybe the meter read, reading may be taken um, a couple weeks from now and the bill would be maybe be 30 weeks after that. So if a customer has a leak that they're unaware of, perhaps a running toilet, um, it, it could be um, a couple of weeks to a month before they know that, that um, they have a, an increased uh, bill. Whereas in, under this process, if they're interested and sign up and, and access the web, they can monitor their, their water usage and help conserve and uh, keep their bills to a minimum. Um, it would cert certainly help us to uh, improve our asset management and uh, keep track of our infrastructure and improve infrastructure reliability. And then with the uh, increased uh, accuracy of the meters and, and more timely data, we can uh, help eliminate meter uh, water use that is not being built. So uh, we started off on this process in, in 2018. Um, we select, uh, issued an, a request for proposals for various vendors who provide um, meter consulting services. And we selected UMS services. Um, they're a national for firm with uh, offices in Raleigh. And um, we started in the fall of 18. Um, they analyzed our processes, our business processes, our, our uh, field processes, looked at our technology um, and used that to develop um, what we put out on the street in February of this year, um, a request for proposals from vendors to provide the automated uh, meter infrastructure equipment. Um, we originally were going to receive those proposals at the end of April, um, but that was delayed for, for COVID and uh, in August, we received those proposals. Our selection committee, which was comprised of members of the finance and water resources departments, um, reviewed the, the proposals along with the recommendation from UMS and um, Corn Maine was the vendor that was selected uh, for further negotiations. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, there were seven responses to this request for proposals for the automated meter project and uh, Corn Maine was the highest scoring and um, we followed up with specific questions to several of the vendors to clarify their, their responses and upon that um, review we again decided on Corn Maine. One of the primary um, aspects of the automated inf meter project is the um, not only the remote reading of the meters and transmission of, and, and transmission of the meter reading data um, by a network system. Many of the vendors used a, um, a fixed network 
that would involve leasing um, property and installing separate um, more or less towers um, to uh, for the infrastructure for this uh, project. Quorum Mains project involves utilizing um, existing cell phone infrastructure. Uh, they have negotiated with um, Verizon, I believe it is, to locate their equipment on Verizon towers um, so that the, the meters would have a, a radio uh, reader encoded on the meter that would send a signal to Quorum Mains equipment on the Verizon towers which would then link to um, the city's billing system. So their proposal offered this as a network as a service system. So they're completely responsible for installing and maintaining the system. So the city would only pay a, an annual fee for this service and their software to um, transmit the data and also link with the uh, customer, our city's billing system and provide the customer portal is provided as a software as a service system. This is cloud-based, very secure, and um, again, limits the need for city um, resources for, from our IT department, as well as our finance and water resources staff. Bob, uh, real quick while you're talking about the systems and the networks, I know one of the things that um, has come up um, and National League of Cities, when cities look at something like this as smart city technology. So even though we're not investing in kind of owning that system, do we have the ability to utilize that for other smart city type? Yes, that, that's a, a very good benefit of this pro, of this, uh, this system. And I'll get to that in a second with the, uh, with a little bit more detail on the, uh, the network. Okay, great. So their, their, their solution includes the replacement of the large meters, the residential meters, um, and the, the mid-range commercial meters with, with various types of Neptune products. Um, we have a long history of using Neptune meters. Um, this will allow us to, to leverage our investment of the meters that are already in the ground. Um, approximately a quarter of the meters that are in service right now are either ready to go um, or can have an encoder added to it, which would eliminate, um, reduce the, the number of meters that actually need replaced for the entire project. Um, the lower RAN gateway is a is the, the backbone of a core main solution with the, this technology is what would be installed on the, uh, on the uh, cell tower infrastructure. Um, the lower ran, I, I use the analogy, um, if you're at your house and you have your Wi-Fi system and you have um, your uh, son or daughter's home from college and you give them um, guest access to your Wi-Fi system. So the lower ran is kind of, kind of the um, radio system, um, or it is the radio system that operates the meters, but it's also, there is a lower ran um, a consortium that um, vendors across the U.S. are making their products um, compatible with um, the smart city technology. So if a, uh, a vendor has, has technology that's certified to, to operate with lower RAN, then, then it, we could allow it to be used on our network. And it could be a city, um, city function, say, you know, related to street lighting, or what are any other uh, city initiatives. And we can also, um, since we would be the first in the area to have the system, if any of the surrounding communities would like to piggyback onto it, then, then we could make arrangements to do that as well. Um, and then the other component is the WaterSmart software is, is the customer portal, the outside facing um, software that our customers can access to, to, uh, to view their, their billing data. And so the, where we're at now with uh, ongoing work and next steps, um, as I said, we've selected Corn Maine. We're in the process of negotiating the scope of the project. Um, and, and the final costs, um, developing a project charter that will set 
kind of uh, the milestones and, and the history of the project. So that as this is a multi-year project, um, if there's staff turnover, city council turnover, everybody can kind of look at this project charter to see why the project was initiated and where, where, we're, uh, where we're headed is kind of our roadmap. Um, the project execution plan is, is uh, documentation of how we will actually go out and, and have a, a, a third party contractor install the meters. And um, so that, that's all in the process of, of being worked on. And with the, the goal of deploying in uh, probably late spring of 2021, if we proceed with Corn Main and reach that agreement and council approves the contract, then they would begin to set up their network, um, integrate their software with our um, billing system, and then begin the meter change up. By using Corn Main and leveraging um, the Neptune system, we're able to extend this, the duration of this project. Um, originally, if you recall, we had talked that, um, that this, this could be a complete change out, change out in, in less than a year, which, which we thought was optimistic and presented many hurdles in and of itself. But with, with the onset of COVID, the economic conditions that we've, we've talked about with, with customers having trouble pay, paying bills, um, the impacts to our um, small businesses and commercial establishments, as well as our larger customers, um, we, we thought that it would be very wise to try to extend this out over several years. And by working with Neptune, our, our current provider, we can, we can implement that over time um, with the thought of, um, in, this, in this instance here, it's about a three-year deployment um, to spread out those impacts. And we'll be able to um, have a, um, the ability to work with our customers and give them advance notice that this is coming and uh, they can, can adjust their usage accordingly. So um, at that, that's all I have for tonight. If you uh, generate any questions, we will try to, to address them. Questions from council? Bob, I think this is a wonderful solution to what you're trying to get done because you're getting what you aim to do and you, you've been able to utilize some, some meters that's already in the ground that's still good. Uh, and you're merging those two situations together that should be uh, more efficient, not only for the customer, but also uh, be more efficient for the, for the city itself in terms of revenue production. Yeah, that's correct. A major part of the project is getting that infrastructure in place, and then that allows us to, to deploy the meters uh, on, a, on an extended time frame. Right. One other thing that I would like to add um, is the software is the big component of this, and one other advantage of Neptune is it allows us to work with the manual reads and the automatic reads at the same time. The Neptune software incorporates both of those. Otherwise it would have been very, um, the, the devil is in the details and it would have been very difficult to use a manual system and an automatic system in the, on the software side. So that's another advantage of going with Neptune. Bob, well, I had a question about the deployment plan. Obviously, extending the time frame out makes sense in some respects, but my assumption is that actually would increase the cost because what some of our cost is with having folks actually have to read meters, and so the efficiency gains there. That that does affect some of the efficiency gains, um, but it, it we have to weigh the impacts to our customers, and and we thought that that would be with with the uncertain economic times that that, that would be. You know, better to we'll still gain the advantages of the of the uh, the technology. It will just take a little bit wrong, longer to recoup those costs. When you say the benefits to our customers, is that you know, with the COVID hit impacting um, a lot of the businesses, they are um, it. We didn't the um, UMS's original. Um, 
prediction in, of return on investment ROI was about seven years. But one of the reasons that the return was that fast was uh, replacing all the large meters first. And with the impact COVID hitting and the impact that has had to businesses, we didn't feel like it was a good thing to uh, do that first. So we are moving the large meters back to the end um, and so that they will have time to adjust to what is coming down the pipeline. And hopefully we will have all recovered from the effects of COVID by that time. And is that because the large meters will be more accurate for the water flow and build them more? Yes, that's exactly right. Right now, large meters will not detect, detect uh, a toilet flush, okay. but the meters that we will be replacing them with will. Every bit of the water will be accounted for. Okay, so it is more that they're already using the water and they're getting it for free. So it's, okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, but the, the, the people who are getting that for free are using a large amount of water. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're not, they're probably our larger customers. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's so a flush of commode compared to the flush they get if they're doing any kind of, especially in, in, in any kind of textile operation, is just it's a whole different world there. Yeah. Yeah, but flushing a toilet shouldn't break the bank there. I just, I just want to make sure That's it doesn't right. uh, pass on cost of the equipment. Um, so, but, all right, other questions from council? All right, appreciate that update. Um, it's been a long meeting this evening. We have one more agenda item, uh, item H, boards and commissions report. So this time we'll recognize Mike Nunn. Good evening, mayor and council. I will try to be brief. I do want to show you, this is an update on a rezoning case that uh, PNZ uh, heard on December 21st. This is my screen. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. You also have the information in your packet, I'm sure, just in case there's... Does everybody see that yet? All right, it's coming up. We've okay. got it. This is the site, it's also on Eric Lane. I think a couple of months ago, we had the uh, the old Bob Evans uh, property come in for a uh, exactly the same request from LI to general business. Um, hang on, my batteries. Uh, get some juice. Okay, the parcel here, I just wanna be sure, be clear, this is not the JR's parcel. This is the parcel, if you're looking at this map, to obviously it's hatched. Um, the northern tool and the other yeah, all the the other development that's not JR. If you if, if you want to look at it that way, but is that parcel is also owned uh, by Mr. John Burton, and he'll be with us tomorrow evening. But this is a request to go from light industrial to general bu general bu business district. It's about twenty five and a half acres. Um, there is, as I mentioned, general business in the area. Our land use plan, and I will show that uh, tomorrow evening does show this whole interchange as, as a mix of general and regional commercial, which is the red in the general business. So it is compatible with the land use plan and PNZ did recommend approval and we had no public comments uh, on this item. And this will be on your agenda, uh, excuse me, for the 19th for a public hearing. Any questions from council on this? I think that's the correct date. Strange piece. Yeah, it'll be on the 19th. Okay. Uh, there's an odd piece, mm -hmm. it seems to me, um, that kind of, it, it, it's on the road, but it's not going to be included. It seems awkward. This is just the parcel that they own. Okay. They don't own the other parcel. Yeah. That the Burton brothers, I believe, John Burton owns this, par this parcel only. It actually has been LI. I was just looking for about 40 years. It was zoned LI in 1981. So um, the, this, the request is to be able to to diversify the use more uh, for general business and retail along the interstate. All right, any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, next city manager report. Harden, you got oh, anything? I don't have anything else, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, council, any, any other comments? I do have one item um, that came across my radar recently, which is that um, the incoming Biden administration is asking communities across the country to do a day of remembrance for all those who've lost their lives to COVID on January 19th at 5.30 p.m. Um, and they're calling on communities, churches, other organizations to need to for cities to light their city halls or have a candle lighting or ringing of the bells. Um, same to churches and other organizations throughout the community. Um, and so I wanted to ask our council if that's something we'd be interested in participating in um, that nationwide day of remembrance uh, and possibly charge staff with uh, choosing if we want to do a lighting or um, something at City Hall. I think that's a great idea. Is it the same evening as our meeting? It is the same evening as our meeting, a little earlier. So there's that convenient kind of correlation there, but. Good idea. It's been a lot of people. Jim, Bob, would that be acceptable to you for staff to put something together for that? That would be. Yep. All right, so Harden, if you can work with staff, Rachel, uh, Morgan, no. I don't think they've released colors for lighting, but um, I, I trust that y'all can figure something out and um, uh, in light of the pandemic and it's continuing toll on our community, I think it's very fitting. So, and I'd encourage churches in the area to participate in that as well. I know we've got some beautiful bell towers around. I think that would make a, an even bigger impact. So. All right. Any other questions, council comments? All right, we appreciate everyone's time tonight for this long meeting. We'll see everyone back here at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.